Good morning, welcome to the Justice Committee's 29th meeting of 2017. There are no apologies. Agenda item number one is a decision to take item five in prior. Item five is consideration of our forward programme. Are we agreed to take this item in private? Agreed, thank you. Uh, agenda item uh, two is our first evidence session on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a spice paper. I welcome James Kelly, the member in charge of the bill, to the meeting. Also attending is George Adam. You're both very welcome. Um, we're taking evidence from two panels and time is extremely tight. There are 11 members on this Justice Committee. Their role is to scrutinise this bill. If um, time allows, therefore, at the end of the members' questioning, um, I'll ask uh, Brian, uh, sorry, George, if there's any question that he wants to ask very briefly. And there will be time allotted, of course, to James Kelly to ask any questions um, when you've heard all the questions and answers at the end. Um, I welcome our first panel, Anthony McGeekin, Procurator Fiscal and, and Engagement, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and Assistant Chief Constable Bernard Higgins, Operational Support, Police Scotland. And can I thank the witnesses for their written submissions, as also, always, that's very helpful. And I'd like to move straight to questions, starting with Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I wonder if I could start by just asking you to comment in general, um, in general terms, if and how behaviour at football has changed since 2012 when the Act came into force. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Justice Committee. Um, I've been in the, the police 29 years, and what I would say that from when I started in 1988 to the current day, uh, football is almost unrecognisable uh, in, in terms of fan behaviour, in terms of, of stadia. Uh, and certainly in the, the last uh, five or six years, we've seen uh, massive improvement in uh, not just fan behaviour, but stadium facilities and the professionalism of key elements of producing a, a football match, for example, the, the stewarding uh, arrangements around it. Um, if I give a, a, an example, uh, in the last four years, we've worked tirelessly with clubs and associations like the Football Safety <coughs> Officers Association to actually reduce the number of, of police officers at football events, um, because that then costs the club less money. But we're only in a position to do that because of infrastructure has improved and actually fan behaviour has improved. Uh, in terms of the, the 2012 Act, what I would say is it's certainly brought to uh, the, the forefront the social consciousness behaviour, what uh, people um, would describe as unacceptable within a, a footballing context. And there has been many occasions since the introduction of the Act where fans have self-reported uh, what they believe to be inappropriate and abusive behaviour. Uh, an example being during the, the Hibs Hearts Scottish Cup final some years ago, uh, where a, a Hearts supporter was making racist and homophobic uh, comments. Um, he was reported to the stewards and then to the police by heart supporters and was duly arrested. Um, so I think that the Act has done two things. It's certainly brought to the, the forefront and the, the wider, not just footballing community, but uh, the wider Scottish community and what is acceptable and what's not unacceptable. And in terms of, of policing football, it certainly uh, made it very clearer uh, when we can take action and when we can't. Thank you. Mr McGeekin. Any comment? Uh, there's no comment that I would like to add in relation okay. to behaviour at football currently. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you, um, ACC Higgins, if you think that uh, repealing this act would send out the wrong message that it maybe is acceptable to revert to the previous uh, bad behaviour, if you like? Um, I think there's a potential for that, uh, ma'am. Uh, it would be very subjective of me to say that it will definitely happen. Um, but repealing that may be interpreted by some as a, a, a lifting of restrictions in terms of how they can behave within football stadia. Then again, it may not. Mm -hmm. your, your feeling is, though, that the Act has helped to improve the behaviour at matches over the past five years? Yeah, uh, and again, you know, I think it's really important to, to stress 
um, that actually, generally speaking, football is very well attended and very well behaved. You know, now let me give you an example. Uh, season 16-17, we arrested 191 people. Um, during that same period, 4 million people went through the turnstiles. So statistically, we're talking about 0.005% of people that actually attend football matches engage in some sort of behaviour that warrants their arrest. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important not to lose sight of the fact that the vast, vast majority of fans attending football matches do so in the, in the spirit of wanting to go and enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question from a, a, a professional policing point of view um, the Act has allowed us to address specific types of behaviour and challenge that behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, and again, to me, the Act has probably uh, raised social consciousness. Now, I have been asked what would happen if the Act would repeal. Well, simply we would continue to try and address the behaviour using other legislation. Um, and again, Mr McGeekin is far more uh, skilled and, and, and knowledgeable about the alternatives. But, you know, th there is no doubt that Football in the last five years, the fans' behaviour has improved greatly, um, but it's a number of factors. It's not simply down to the Act. It's down to fans' associations taking responsibility. It's about the club stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility. It's about the, the better informed infrastructure, the closer liaison between police, uh, football safety officers, um, a whole combination of effects, and yes, the Act as well, but not in isolation. And is it accurate to say that the Act goes beyond the football uh, stadium? It can, you know, it can apply out with and coming to from the match, etc. Yes. Or anywhere, actually, in street corners? Yes, that's correct. I would flag that the Act not only goes beyond the stadium in relation to Section 1, but Section 6 of the Act is not connected with football. Yes. I think we're going to come on to that, that later. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mary. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, and my question to a degree follows on from the line of questioning that um, my colleague Rona has, has opened up. Um, because we've received a number of submissions um, from football supporters stating that the relationship between supporters and the police has deteriorated significantly since the 2012 Act has, has been in place. Would you like to comment on that, um, ACC Higgins? Yeah, by, by all means. Um, from my perspective, I, I don't see that. Um, you know, I have got officers that regularly liaise with uh, fans groups, you know, uh, Scotland Supporters Direct, um, the Tartan Army, uh, Scottish Disabled Supporters Association, a kind of national level, a local level, um, within all our territorial uh, divisions. We have uh, single points of contact with the clubs and through the, the club fan liaison officers there is that contact. Um, so we work very, very hard um, to, uh, you know, develop relationships with any fan base. My door's always open. I'll happily speak to anybody about any aspect of, of policing football they want to. Um, uh, and certainly, if that's a perception that the uh, relationship between the police has deteriorated, then that's something that we need to, we need to work on and improve. Um, and often, the, you know, the reality is that that came into force. You know, I make no comment about the, the rights and wrongs of, of whether, when it was introduced, but the reality is I'm a police <coughs> officer and I have to apply the law of the land as it stands, um, even if the, that law is uh, uh, unpopular uh, with certain sections. It's not within my gift um, to take a, a decision not to, not to uh, enforce it where appropriate. Mm. And the other comment that has been made is that policing um, is, is seen as overzealous. Well, I, I've just given you a start there, uh, ma'am, where I've said we've arrested 0.05% mm. of people attending football matches. That doesn't seem to me to be overzealous. I think that's pretty proportionate. 191 people out of uh, an attendance of 4 million. Mm. And in, in answer to the, the first question you were asked, um, your opening comments were um, that, that football has changed um, dramatically over the time that, that you have, have been in the, the police. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I suppose, struggling to understand the significance of the 2012 Act. If, if football is almost unrecognisable from, from when you went into the force, I, I, I don't really understand the significant impact that the 2012 Act could have made because there has been a gradual shift in behaviour. Yeah, I mean, I think what the Act has done... To, to it, when I, when I joined the police, and again, I'm swinging the lamp a bit here, but back in 1988, 
it was pretty acceptable to go to an old firm match and listen to sectarian singing from both sides of, a, uh, of, of the old firm. Now people recognise that that's wrong in a modern society. Sectarian singing, homophobic abuse, racial abuse is simply not acceptable. What I would suggest is that the 2012 Act has put that in the forefront of the public's mind and there is now a greater understanding, perhaps not a, an acceptance of the Act, but there's a greater social consciousness and awareness of some of the challenges that not, don't just exist within Scottish football, but within Scottish society. If, if there's only 191 arrests that, that were made last, last season, would you agree with the comment from supporters that there is little, no evid or little or no evidence of significant disorder in football then? Um, it depends what you mean by significant disorder. You know, in 2015, we had several thousand Rangers and Hibs fans take to the, the field at Hamden Park and engage in significant sustained violence and disorder. Uh, as a result of that, we arrested uh, over a, a period of months, certainly 184 people. A couple of years ago, um, one of the most significant elements of disorder we had was a mass brawl involving up to, I think it was 30 or 40 fans from Airdrie and Air United within Coatbridge Town Centre. Uh, a young detective sergeant sustained a broken jaw at that. So, yes, whilst statistically, you know, 4 million people attending and 191 arrests, that doesn't actually reflect the massive operations, joint operations between ourselves and stewards and, and clubs to ensure that these, you know, 900 plus professional football matches each year go off as peacefully and, and safely as possible. And is the change in the policing operation due to the 2012 Act? No. Um, I took uh, charge of, of um, being the strategic lead for football uh, probably about five, six years ago. Um, and one of the, the things that I determined we were going to do, um, because policing is an expensive uh, asset. You know, if you, if you employ a number of police officers, it's going to be much more expensive than if you employ an accredited stewarding company. So what I undertook with the football authorities and clubs was to try and reduce the number of police officers every match and therefore financially they would be more beneficial. But to do that, we had to do other things, you know, work with the Football Safety Officers Association to make sure that the safety and security of grounds would meet the, the uh, requirements of the safety advisory groups. Um, and that's been a process that has happened over many, many years. And again, evidence of the, the police commitment to that is that out with the, the old firm, every major club in Scotland has now held police-free games where there has been no police officers at the stadium um, because we are working very hard to make these a, a really safe environment. OK, thank you. Maurice Curry. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mr Higgins, can I address yourself? Could you elaborate on the challenges which officers would face when policing in the football environment should, uh, would be, uh, should the Act, the 2012 Act, be repealed? And, and how would Police Scotland deal with these challenges? Um, Operationally, it wouldn't, it wouldn't pose as a, a significant challenge, respectfully. Uh, we would still continue to discharge our duties in the same manner. Uh, what we would be seeking is guidance from uh, the Fiscal's Office about what charges we should now apply as opposed to the, the provisions of the Section 1 Act. Uh, and I know Mr McGeehan has got some views in that, and if the Act is repealed, then I'm also quite sure that, that guidance will be forthcoming from Crown Office on that very subject. But in terms of uh, boots on the ground and how we would go about policing a, a football match, um, little, if anything, would change. Okay. Mr. Higgins, you have a comment? Yes, and the Lord Advocate uh, has published guidelines in relation to the operation of the 2012 Act uh, by the police. And um, we would intend to publish similar guidelines in relation to the application of breach of the peace and Section 38 of the Criminal Law Consolidation Scotland Act should Parliament decide to repeal the Act. Okay, thank you. And that's it. It's good um, Fulton. Yeah, I, I thought you were coming to me a bit later, convener. <coughs> Apologies for that. Um, I'd ask, like to ask both panel members about if they think that if the Act is repealed, there would be effectively a gap in the law. Um, and if they think that that would therefore make games more or less safe for fans? Um, uh, yes, in my assessment there would be a gap in the law. Um, in relation to Section 1 of the Act, 
Um, there are alternative charges available to prosecutors, principally, as I've indicated, Section 38 of the Criminal Law Consolidation Scotland Act, um, or sorry, the, the Criminal Justice and Licences Scotland Act 2010 and Breach of the Peace. Uh, there are similar um, alternatives in relation to Section 6 of the 2012 Act in the form of Section 127 of the Communications Act 2003. However, uh, both, of those, both of those alternative options in relation to both Section 1 um, and uh, Section 6 have limitations. In relation to the Section 1 alternatives, uh, those alternatives propose a different legal test against which an accused person's offending must be assessed. Um, that test is, in short, uh, fear and alarm, as opposed to the test set out in terms of Section 1. Section 1 also has an additional utilitarian value for prosecutors in the sense that it, has, that it has an extraterritorial element and therefore it can currently be used by prosecutors to address offending committed by persons normally resident in Scotland but committed out with Scotland. That ability does not exist in relation to Section 38 or Breach of the Peace and that ability has been used by prosecutors to successfully prosecute hate crime committed by persons normally resident in Scotland out with Scotland. In relation to Section 6, um, there is an alternative in terms of Section 127 of the Communications Act 2003, but it has similar limitations. Its first limitation is, uh, as I've described, in relation to Section 1, and that is that, that uh, Section 127 of the 2003 Act contains no extraterritorial element and therefore would be unable to prosecute offences committed by persons normally resident in Scotland where those offences have occurred out with Scotland. And again, we've used Section 6 successfully to prosecute hate crime committed by persons normally resident in Scotland intended for a Scottish audience. The other advantage of Section 6 is in relation to the sentencing powers available to the sentencer. In terms of the Communications Act 2003, only a summary level sentence is available to sentencers. In terms of Section 6 of the 2012 Act, solemn level sentences are available to sentencers. And those solemn level sentences have been used by a sentencer um, to address serious hate crime perpetrated by a Scottish accused. That Scottish accused um, used the internet to post hate crime supportive of a, of a prescribed terrorist organisation, namely ISIS. The severity of the accused actions were reflected in the sentence's starting point for sentence, which was 24 months. The sentence reduced that 24, 24 month sentence to 16 months to reflect the fact that the accused pled guilty. But the reality is that that option for the sentencer to reflect the severity of the accused's accepted behaviour would not have been available if the alternative charge in terms of section 127 of the 2003 Act had been deployed. There's a lot of technical detail there, which I think in our lines of questioning, as we progress, we'll try and tease out, because I think it'd be impossible, really, to take in everything you've just said, and with, yeah. with respect, we'll break it down. Yeah, you, you, you were in free flow there, but I, I was aware that you were going to a, another uh, line of questioning later on. But I, I think it's suffice to say that you do feel that there would be a gap in the law if the Act is, refu is, is repealed. And um, you have concerns about other legislation, as, uh, as you've mentioned. Um, uh, um, ACC Higgins, have you got anything to add to that? That is actually the case. Would there be a gap in the law, or would the existing law cover it? Uh, there, there would be a gap in the law. The 2012 Act gives prosecutors powers that are not available um, under either breach of the peace, Section 38, or the Communications Act. We'll come on to later exactly in what situation you think there would be that gap. Thornton? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, good morning, sir. Um, I wouldn't add to uh, what Anthony said. Uh, the question about would this make the repeal of that make it more uh, dangerous or less safe in football and environment, that's very subjective. Um, uh, of course, as I alluded to earlier, there is the potential that many might see this as a, a, a lifting of restrictions. Um, which means perhaps behaviour would deteriorate, which then would mean the consequence of additional police officers and stewarding having to, to be deployed to uh, stadiums. But the reality is we just don't know. We would need to wait uh, and see how fan, fan groups reacted to it. Okay, my, 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 my last question, convener, if I may, is um, 
is in relation to uh, uh, it's probably for yourself, ACC Higgins. Do you do you have a clear, do you feel that the police have a clear understanding what offensive behaviour uh, actually covers uh, for the Section One offence? Because we have heard some evidence, for example, that um, um, from some of the evidence that we received, that you know that some people feel they've been charged under the Act for arguing with stewards. Is it your uh, understanding that, that police officers would know what constitutes an offence? Um, yes, is the, the short answer. Um, I think, again, without throwing statistics at you, um, I think for every person that we arrest under the Act, Crown Office takes action in 89% of those cases, which would, to me, demonstrate a high level of understanding by the arresting, uh, arresting officers. I think it would be good if you could give a, a really uh, good and, and concise example of, of what offensive behaviour actually consists of. Um, offensive behaviour is, is behaviour that is offensive to any reasonable person and um, the Lord Advocate has published guidelines in relation to um, uh, behaviour uh, that may be offensive in terms of the 2012 Act. Um, that, that definition is set out at page four of the Lord Advocate's published guidelines dated August 2015 um, and it provides that, that um, uh, the offence does not, I mean, it's, in effect, it is, it is uh, one and a half pages of, of narrative. I, I can go through that if, if that would be beneficial to the committee. If you um, select one, one example, that would be kind of good. Is there actually examples in that narrative? Um, yes, it, 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 at page five, uh, the first paragraph of page five provides that while it is a matter for the judgment of a police officer, whether a song or other behaviour, including this, the display of offensive flags or banners, is likely to be offensive to a reasonable person, having regard to the nature of the material or song, including its lyrics and any add-ons, the surrounding circumstances and the context in which it is being displayed or sung, the following are, are examples of the types of displays, songs and chants which are likely to be offensive to a reasonable person. The first bullet point is flags, banners, songs or chants in support of terrorist organisations. The second bullet point example is flags, banners, songs or chants which glorify, celebrate or mock events involving the loss of life or serious injury. It should be noted that in order for this offence to be committed, in addition to the display, song or chant being offensive or threatening, it must be likely to incite public disorder. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the, the police could give us a specific example of how that's being applied then and, and the police's um, interpretation of it. Um, pretty much we have uh, arrested a number of people over the years for um, you know, displaying pro-IRA banners, for example. Um, we have arrested a number of uh, people um, you know, for singing, for example, the Billy Boys uh, with the, the add-on uh, and that about being up to your knees in Fenian blood, um, which is offensive and would uh, likely incite public disorder. Um, so it, it's pretty commonplace uh, in terms of, of what we can apply that act to. Uh, and as I say, in the, the general um, legislation, should this act be repealed, then that behaviour we would still challenge and we would still arrest for. Now, whether that behaviour became a breach of the peace or a Section 38 offence would be a matter for, for Crown to give us guidance for. So the offensive behaviour itself, as it's been um, defined and the examples given, if the Act was repealed, it would still be covered by legislation? Um, by and large, uh, with the exceptions that, that Anthony uh, alluded to in terms of, of the, the gaps. But the, 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 the very general um, offences that we arrest for would still be covered. Okay. Liam MacArthur. Sorry, Ben, you had a very short Thank you, Vera. Just for, for clarity on the same point to, to the Crown, uh, in your evidence you state that the legislation does not particularise the behaviour that a reasonable person would likely consider offensive. Yes. Um, but it, and it is not unusual for legislation to contain a test in relatively broad terms. I wondered if you wanted to comment on that specifically. And also, you state that the, uh, the Crown does not agree that the legislation is applied arbitrarily or unfairly. And I think these, these are important points to highlight from your evidence in relation to the question that the convener asked. Uh, well, in relation to the lack of definition um, of offensive behaviour as prescribed in the Act, uh, that's not an unusual situation in terms of legislation. 
and a type of um, behaving and offending which the majority of us are very familiar with would be dangerous driving. Um, Section 2 of the Road Traffic Act um, prohibits dangerous driving but pr provides no definition of what may or may not constitute dangerous driving and what may or may not constitute dangerous driving is defined by the particular circumstances of each individual case. Um, the, uh, the use of offensive as a test is also not unique to this 2012 Act. So, for example, one of the alternatives that is identified um, as a possible remedy, should the Act be repealed, is the Communications Act 2003. That Act itself prohibits the sending of a public electronic, so the sending of a message that is grossly offensive or of an indecent, obscene or menacing character. So, again, we have the offensiveness of an Act um, as a reference point for criminal behaviour without any specification of what may or may not constitute offensive behaviour. In relation to the second part of your question, which was, was a rejection on COPFS's part that the Act is applied uh, illiberally, um, then I, my position there is that, that in order for an Act to be committed under the 2012 Act, it is not simply sufficient that the Act is offensive, but rather that the Act must be one of five types of behaviour specified by the Act. And it, and it must also um, be behaviour that incites or is likely to incite public disorder. It is only if those two tests are met that, that a charge against an accused person can properly be brought. Thank you for that clarification. Lee McCarthy. Just picking up on thanks, uh, Good morning. I'm just picking up a point. The, I, I was interested in, in your reference back to the, the communications, the 2003 Communications Act. You referred to uh, its reference to uh, grossly offensive and, uh, and obscene. In a sense, um, from a lay perspective, that would appear to set the bar slightly higher than um, uh, offensive as, as defined in the 2012 Act. Um, do you see that as potentially problematic? Um, in that if something is offensive, uh, um, grossly offensive, then presumably there is no dispute or, or, or much less scope for dispute, whereas something that is deemed offensive may be offensive to, to some but not necessarily to others, and therefore may be seen as more of a, a judgment call um, made by, by officers and ultimately by the, the Crown. Uh, my analysis would be that it sets not a higher bar but a different bar. So in relation to the 2012 Act, the bar that is set is that the behaviour is both offensive and either incites or is likely to incite public disorder. That second element is not necessary in relation to the Communications Act. A different test is applied in relation to the Communications Act. If you were to ask me in isolation, um, is offensive behaviour less than grossly offensive behaviour, then in isolation I would answer that question yes. But in, in answer to the question, does the Communications Act 2003 set a higher bar than the 2012 <coughs> Act, um, I would suggest not. It simply sets a different bar. And in one view, the 2012 Act bar is a higher one. I, just turning back to the line of question that, that Fulton McGregor was pursuing there, um, I, he raised the, the fact that concerns have been highlighted by um, supporters groups about the approach taken to the, by the police in relation to um, interpretation of offensive behaviour. Obviously, the Act has been enforced now for a number of years. What level of concerns have there been um, amongst officers uh, about um, how they should be interpreting uh, offensive behaviour? And what discussions have there been with um, fans groups, either individual fans groups uh, associated with particular clubs or across the piece? about the way in which officers are being seen to, uh, to be interpreting offensive behaviour over that period? Certainly, um, when the Act was uh, introduced, uh, there was a training package which was delivered across the force, um, as was every new piece of legislation. And then a lot of our thinking uh, has been developed through case law and, and stated cases. Um, so, you know, we do understand what offensive behaviour is. Um, in terms of concerns raised by uh, fans group, um, again, 
I'm open to any sort of engagement. Um, recently, uh, some of my, my staff uh, went to the Supporters Direct Association. It was a, an annual conference, uh, and essentially fans, fan groups from across the country were there, and they uh, spent some time engaging and, and delivering a presentation about some of the challenges of policing football events. Um, uh, and it's always a, an open dialogue. You know, um, it's all, you know, some officers um, at the start of the act in areas out with the central belt um, probably weren't exposed to uh, some of the, the, the chanting and uh, songs that uh, predominantly old firm fans will, will do. So we, we had to educate them in terms of recognising what could be potentially offensive offensive singing and chanting, but that was right in the early days, you know, uh, we're now four or five years into the Act. I would say that uh, pretty much every officer's got a firm grip and understanding of the, the Act and what uh, falls within the, the definition of offensive behaviour. So would you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but so you would, you would argue that at this stage um, there is unlikely to be um, <coughs> any legitimate suggestion that this is being policed um, uh, inconsistently or in different ways in different parts of the no. different parts of the country. Uh, again, we have got 42 professional clubs uh, in Scotland. Uh, as of today, uh, 24 of those clubs uh, have had people charged with offences under this Act, and that ranges from Elgin and Inverness right the way down to Queen of the South uh, and everything in between. Um, so that, to me, would suggest that the police officers policing Elgin City have got a good understanding of what's happening with the act as the police officers are policing Glasgow, Celtic, Rangers, Hibs, Harps, or whoever. I, I'm just going to ask Mr McGeehan a, a, a follow-up question. I think that the figure of mid-80% of um, reports from police are, are then taken, to, uh, uh, taken forward for, for prosecution. What, what has been the pattern over that four or five years in terms of police reports to, to prosecutions? Has that 80, 80 odd percent uh, been consistent across the piece? Has it, has it increased over the, the, the three, four, five years? That, that information um, is published by COPFS. Uh, there's a COPFS hate crime publication and within the publication there's a table which sets out the numbers of charges that are reported to COPFS and the action taken in connection with those charges. Um, and uh, if I, it, it set out a table 6A of that, um, of that published document and in relation, if I, I could go through the years if that would be helpful. Be, if you could top line figures would be helpful. So in, in uh, Statistics, perhaps, um, in more detail, which we've got a very... Uh, OK, carry on, then. OK, carry on, um, Liam. Uh, yes? Uh, so in 2012-13, in, uh, uh, 267 charges were reported in terms of Section uh, uh, 1, and no action was taken in, in connection with 23 of those charges. In 2013-14, uh, 206 charges reported, and no action taken in connection with 16 charges. 2014-15, 193 charges, and no action taken in connection with four charges. 15-16, 286 charges reported, and no action taken in relation to 14 charges. 2016-17, 377 charges, and no action taken in connection with seven charges. The, yeah. I can make the full table available to the committee yeah. um, because it provides further information in relation to other actions taken by prosecutors beyond and separate from court proceedings. Okay. Thank you. Follow through on that. Uh, Maurice Corries, supplementary. Mr Higgin, has, has, has the relationship between supporters and the police changed since the legislation was introduced? And, and if so, why has it changed? Um, there are there are pockets of supporters where the relationship has certainly changed. Um, but I would say out of the four million people that regularly attend Scottish football, then 99% of them, the relationship remains exactly the same. Right, OK. Thank you. Uh -huh. Can we maybe establish why in some cases um, they don't, you don't proceed? 
Yes, again, uh, detail in relation to the reasons for proceedings not being taken is set out in the hate crime publication. Um, and again, I could I can take the committee um, through that if that if that would be a benefit. If you could um, just succinctly um, explain, you know, your understanding of why that would be helpful. Uh, well, uh, at page 16 of the uh, Crown Office publication, um, Hate Crime in Scotland 2016-17, uh, page 16, table 8, breaks down the reasons for no action um, in relation to offensive behaviour at Football um, and Threatening Communications Act 2012 and separates uh, the no action decisions in relation to both section 1 and section 6. In relation to section 1, uh, which would appear to be the focus at present, the total number of charges in which no action was taken was seven, and breaking down the reasons uh, for no action being taken in relation to those charges, uh, one was as a result, well, uh, to explain, when we mark a decision um, for no action, prosecutors will assign a code to the decision, provide an indication of the reason for their decision-making process. And when I uh, use this terminology, I'm referring to the codes that prosecutors would use and record for particular no action decisions. Um, so breaking those seven cases down, uh, one was marked no action for the prosecutorial code, not a crime. Uh, one was marked no, no action due to insufficient admissible evidence. Four were marked no action due to further action being assessed as being disproportionate. Uh, and uh, one was marked no action for another reason. Um, and uh, our prosecutorial codes allow some flexibility for prosecutors uh, to account for uh, cases where prosecution, prosecution is not in the public interest, but the reasons uh, that prosecution or prosecutorial action is not in the public interest perhaps don't match um, some of the easily, read, easily uh, available codes to prosecutors, and that's why we have a prosecutorial code other reason, um, and that's what that refers to uh, in relation to one case. It probably would be very helpful for the committee if you could write to us, just summarising the information for the year since that came into force, including the information that you gave to Liam uh, MacArthur. Certainly. Yeah, thank you. Right, can... Liam Kerr. Good morning. Uh, you talked earlier of the Lord Advocate's guidelines, and ACC Higgins talked about uh, some specific songs. Now, it's been suggested by some supporters that certain songs which are sung at football matches uh, result in charges and prosecutions, uh, but if those same songs are sung at a concert venue, that can be done with impunity. Uh, do you think this, is, this anomaly is why football fans have come to the view that they are being unfairly targeted and criminalised? Um, uh, good morning, Mr Kerr. I'm not aware of any songs being sung at any concerts. Um, however, if that was reported to us, then we would investigate it, and I'm quite sure uh, we would report that to uh, the Procurator Fiscal. So of the 191 out of 4 million hmm. uh, arrests, I think you said, that have been made, how many of those took place away from a ground, or away, f away from the cartilage of a ground, such as in pubs or bars? Uh, I think the raw data I've got, it's about within football stadia. So all arrests are taking place, So, because the Act specifically extends it, I believe, doesn't it? It does, yes. But the, the 191 arrests are, aren't 191 arrests under the Act, it's 191 arrests in total. And that will include things like common assaults. You know, so it's not 191 arrests under the Act, it's 191 arrests in total. How many arrests are made under the Act? In, in that 191? I don't have that breakdown, but I can get it to you. I, I may be able to assist there. Um, I can understand that perception, but I would suggest that perception is based upon a false assumption. That false assumption is that the singing of that song would not constitute a criminal offence in any other context. It may well do. It may well constitute the offence of breach of the peace or a contravention of Section 38. In relation to your second question, which was in relation to statistical data about the locus of Section 1 offences, and would suggest that that information may well be available from the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government produces annual research in connection with the 2012 Act and analyses the locus of particular offences and the percentage of those offences which occur within football stadia or out with football stadia. And therefore, if that's information that would be of value 
uh, then I would suggest that that request uh, might well be made to Scottish Government colleagues. Thank you. Uh, to come at it from the other side, some stakeholders have argued that the provisions in Section 1 of the Act should be extended to cover things like parades. Uh, so at present, what charges would be brought if the songs that we're talking about, for example, uh, in support of terrorist organisations were in evidence at these events? Uh, and is it your view, therefore, that the Act should actually be extended to cover these things? Um, policing parades is a, a very challenging environment, um, regardless of, of uh, what type of parade it is, whether it's a, a loyalist parade, a, a Republican parade, um, they, they do bring their unique challenges. Um, uh, and what we do is we'll arrest individuals for breach of the peace, Section 38 offences, uh, and then report it to, to Crown Office. Um, the matter of extending uh, the Section 1 or the provisions of this Act to cover parades, um, I would need to give that some thought. Um, often uh, it could be helpful, uh, there's no question of that, but often uh, what we will do is a, a police service will take a, a fairly neutral view um, on uh, legislation uh, until we see the drafting of it. Uh, and then we would give a, a, an operational perspective on how this would actually uh, be applied in the real world. Um, so I would um, ba basically hold my own counsel until I saw more detail on that particular, particular suggestion. Okay. Uh, you talked there about the, the real world. I just want to ask a bit of a daft laddy question, if I may, yeah. ACC again, sure. Higgins. Uh, what would you do? What would the police do if the entire stand breaks into offensive behaviour? If the ent entire... The entire stand breaks into song. Uh, uh, frequently happens. Uh -huh. Yeah, frequently happens. And, and what we do is um, we will use the, the stadium CCTV. We will deploy uh, police officers with cameras. Uh, we will film and then we will try and identify the main protagonists and arrest them. Right. Uh, Mr McKeehan, th there have been a number of uh, appeals in relation to convictions under the Section 1 offence, just going back to uh, following on from Liam MacArthur's question earlier. Uh, how many of those appeals have been successful and on what grounds were they successful? COPFS doesn't hold data in relation to um, the numbers of appeals in connection with the 2012 Act specifically um, or their outcomes. An accused person may appeal a whole variety of judicial decisions at a number of different stages uh, within the criminal justice process. Um, our database is an operational one designed to support the effect of prosecution and investigation of crime. We don't hold a database um, or data in relation to numbers of appeals connected with the 2012 Act, uh, their nature or their outcome. Um, if that, again, if that data was of use, uh, then a request for that data might be made to um, the Judiciary Office. Thank you. Uh, one final question for me. Uh, ACC Higgins, uh, if this Act were repealed, you've talked uh, earlier on about the, the fans' clubs kind of stepping up in the last few years, the clubs themselves stepping up, uh, there's obviously the UA for restrictions, FIFA restrictions, this sort of thing. What actually would be the practical impact of repealing this legislation? Um, again, that, that's a, a very subjective question, Mr. Kerr. Um, it might, nothing might happen. Equally so, people might interpret this as a, a lifting of perceived restrictions and we could uh, revert to behaviour that we saw in the, the 80s and 90s. You know, I mean, I, I've gone on record in saying that some of the challenges within football, hate crime, you know, hate crime isn't a football issue. Hate crime is a, an issue for this country. Mm -hmm. um, and it just manifests itself often within the football environment. But I can uh, no more arrest my way out of changing, you know, hate crime and sectarianism within this country. Uh, country. It's got to be a far more widing approach to challenging behaviour that is inappropriate. Um, it just ha so happens that a lot of the inappropriate behaviour manifests itself within a football stadium. But that doesn't necessarily mean to say the, football, uh, the, 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 the problem lies with football. 
problem lies within wider Scottish society, because we still see offensive behaviour in the streets of Scotland on a Saturday night. Um, so operationally, um, I don't know what the repeal of this Act would do, but what I, what I will say is that Police Scotland is absolutely committed to continuing to work with all multi-agency partners to try and address the scourge that is hate crime, no matter where the, that form takes, whether it's within a football stadium or in Sucky Hall Street on Saturday night. Thank you. Supplementaries, one from Fault and, and one from Mary. But before I move on to that, can I ask you a little bit about this um, non-recording of appeals, um, Mr McGeekin? It would seem to me just logical if the Crown and Procurator Fiscal was looking at its prosecution policy and there were 95% of appeals, for example, unlikely, on uh, particular charges, they would want to, to look and determine why there were so many appeals. Do you consider there's a gap there that might be helpful um, in, in helping you to prosecute more effectively? Yeah, our appeals unit do... Um, uh, monitor significant appeals um, and we do consider the outcome of those appeals as the impact upon um, any prosecutorial policy but in terms of a database for example of uh, a simple numerical database of the numbers of appeals that relate to the 2012 Act and um, the nature of those appeals we do not record that data. Do you think that would be helpful to, to record? Uh, um, I would suggest that, that, that what is particularly helpful is identifying those appeals which have a particular impact upon a particular area of the law, and our, our appeals unit do that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that a simple numerical volume of appeals would be particularly useful in terms of indicating an area of the law or policy that requires consideration by Crown Office. As I've indicated, an accused person can appeal at a variety of different stages of the, appeal, of the criminal justice process. Um, that appeal uh, might be, for example, in connection with a 2012 Act offence, but the appeal might be limited to the decision by the Sheriff to remand him or her in custody pending trial or remand him or her in custody pending sentence. An appeal can be an appeal against conviction, an appeal against conviction and sentence, or an appeal against sentence. Um, and therefore, a simple numerical tally of the numbers of appeals would not tell us very much in terms of any particular area of the law. What would be significant would be those significant appeals that offer particular direction um, to prosecutors, police officers and defence agents in relation to significant areas of law. We do monitor those and we do amend, adapt and reflect upon our policies in light of those significant appeals. I understand you analyse each, um, each appeal but it's a wee bit like seeing the wood from the trees, while the, the figure itself, um, in isolation, is fairly meaningless. Um, I, I think if you add it to your an analytical data, then um, that might well be very helpful just to start <coughs> teasing out 95% of these, they were appeal at this a, a certain stage, and then further down, there could well be a core percentage of appeals that was actually um, hitting at the, the policy itself and the effectiveness of it. And I think there the statistic used in conjunction with the other information that you have would be helpful. Do you have a view of this at all, um, ACC Higgins? I, I understand exactly why Mr McGeekin's explanation about the, the whole variety of appeals um, uh, and the reasons for them. Um, so I do agree uh, that a, a single figure wouldn't actually tell us very much, but there's probably merit in breaking it down further. But um, it might be a useful tool because yeah. in this parliament consistently we talk about the lack of recorded data and how we'll never improve things if we don't have the full information. So it's perhaps something to reflect on. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr McGeehan um, uh, for some comments on the use of diversion schemes in relation to this offence. We received some um, evidence from Fans Against Criminalisation uh, in the written submission that on request of a Freedom of Information that only two people had been offered a uh, diversion in relation to sectarian offences. Uh, is this the case and, and have you got any comments on, on why that would be? It will the, the, um, the evidence in relation to 
two persons being diverted uh, resulted from a freedom of information um, request that an organisation made to COPFS and that data reflects uh, the information that was provided by COPFS at that time. We can provide up-to-date data in relation to diversion figures, again, if that would be useful. Um, but the overarching commentary that I would offer in that regard is that COPFS would always support, in appropriate cases, um, interventions or diversion that address the causes of behaviour. Um, but I would stress that it is in relation to appropriate cases um, and those appropriate cases would be identified with reference to our published prosecution code. So we would look at um, the severity of the offence and then a variety of factors as to what the appropriate outcome is for that accused. Um, and the variety of factors might well include the history of the accused in terms of his or her uh, criminal record, any personal circumstances of the accused, and also, as I've said, the severity of the offence. Um, the other overarching observation we'd make is that, that in relation to sacro diversion, it is only relatively recently that sacro diversion was extended to cover all hate crime. Previously, the sacro diversion scheme only related to sectarian educa or education in relation to sectarian issues. It is a minority of offences that are reported to COPFS in terms of Section 1 that would qualify or be relevant for a sectarian um, diversion scheme and that therefore informed the low diversion rates that you've referred to. The other tension for prosecutors is um, addressing the accused uh, offending behaviour not only in the future but also immediately and that tension was reflected in the 2015 academic study conducted by Sturt Stirling University. One of the recommendations of that study was that there should be an option whereby prosecute, where, whereby, where not, the, the recommendation wasn't specific to prosecutors, but actually could be taken to combine both diversion and a football banning order. And in that way, you would prevent the offending both immediately and in the future. Now, at present, that option isn't available to prosecutors. If we think that a football banning order is appropriate to, to address an accused uh, foot, uh, behavior in the future, then I'm afraid that the only option for us is to initiate criminal proceedings. So, so, so what would you say to criticism that has been, a, been made, that young men particularly, because that's what we're hearing in the evidence, with perhaps no previous criminal record, have been uh, criminalised through the Act? Would you, would you have a comment on that? Um, um, what I would say is that... that uh, the, the, I, I, have, I have read the critique uh, that this Act focuses on young men. Um, I would suggest that, that, uh, that the conclusion that, that this Act focuses on young football fans um, is an incorrect one. A conclusion that an Act focuses on young male persons in particular, or even male persons in particular, might similarly be arrived at if we were to look at those persons who commit other types of criminal offences, such as sexual offences. And we, we would see that there is a significant proportion of accused persons in relation to sexual offences who are male. In relation to the criminalisation of football fans, um, I would suggest that it, it is irrelevant for the purposes of proving a case under the 2012 Act that an accused person is a football fan. Um, and, and again, I, I've, I've read the critique that, uh, that this Act criminalises um, young male, males with, with no uh, uh, record of criminal offending. But if I can make this real, uh, to borrow um, a phrase, um, this month uh, uh, there was national press coverage of a conviction under the 2012 Act in relation to homophobic behaviour. Um, and that homophobic behaviour um, occurred at a Dundee match. Um, and if the committee would, would bear with me, I'll um, find the, the coverage in question. Me. I, I can't locate it at present, but in effect it was, it was an accused person who had um, 
engage in homophobic behaviour at a Dundee match, um, addressing homophobic comments at um, a Dundee football player, and that person had a significant criminal record, including a previous uh, banning order and including um, significant previous offending um, of violence. Um, I would refute the suggestion that this act is used to target young males with no criminal record. Okay, and, and I suppose just to uh, finish off, you would... Sorry, Convena. You would uh, you would support the the use of diversion where appropriate and perhaps the expansion of it. I, I would go uh, further than that. I, I would confirm that prosecutors. We, we do have case mark instructions for prosecutors in relation to the 2012 Act, and those those case mark instructions positively encourage prosecutors to consider diversion in appropriate cases. But is, it is the identification of appropriate cases um, that is the issue. Supplementary to um, ACC Higgins, you spoke a moment ago about the, the wider issue in Scottish society of the behaviour that we're talking about this morning. We don't just see it at football grounds. Do you think that the increased police focus on this issue has had any impact on reducing bigotry in wider society? <clears throat> I would like to think so. Um, I think we are one of a number of agencies that contribute to, to the you know, the scourge that is sectarianism, which has been described affecting this country. Um, so yes is, is the short answer, ma'am. Um, I don't think we've had a particular focus <coughs> on, uh, on enforcing the Act. I think we have policed operational uh, games and then applied the appropriate charge when we arrest uh, some people or some persons. Uh, and again, if I could just maybe add to, to Mr McGregor's uh, question about criminalising of young men, um, I have got a, a very simple view. Um, in the absence of this act, those same young men would have been arrested but charged with a different offence in all but uh, every case, with the exceptions that, that, that uh, Anthony made in terms of the gaps. But if you were charged with uh, you know, singing a, uh, an offensive song under the Offensive Behaviour Act, then in the absence of that, you would have almost certainly been arrested and charged with a breach of the peace or a Section 838 offence. So I, I do not accept the argument that the Act has criminalised young men. It certainly brought it to the <coughs> forefront, but it would have still have happened in the, in the Act's absence. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ben? I would like to ask, uh, as you, if you can, from the Crown, just some questions again about question, uh, Section 6. Uh, I know you, you referred to it earlier. One thing that's, that's clear is that if this piece of legislation is repealed, that will include Section 6 and its, its uh, focus on threatening communications. And I, I noted that in your written evidence, you stated that you know, the behaviour that is covered by Section 6 uh, is not in connection with a football match, but has been used successfully to prosecute individuals who have made serious threats of violence against members of the public, including threats of murder and individuals who have made threats towards Jewish, Muslim and Catholic communities designed to stir up hatred on the basis of religious grounds. And it has also been used successfully to prosecute accused who have used social media to post threatening material designed to stir up religious hatred and which referenced the prescribed terrorist organisation ISIS. I just wondered if you could expand further on your, on your comments earlier on how important Section 6 is in terms of the, the criminal law and, and dealing with current threat and communications and uh, how repeal of Section 6 may leave prosecutors less able to secure convictions of such threatening communications? Um, I would describe Section 6 as um, affording uh, prosecutors three particular advantages. Uh, the first is that um, one of the pieces of logic behind Section 6 was to address a debate in connection with the Communications Act 2003 and its applicability to the variety of ways in which electronic communications can be used by persons. So, sec so the 2003 Act relates to the sending of communications um, and there have been questions and challenges in relation to whether or not the whole variety of actions that an accused person may take on the internet constitute the sending of a communication as opposed to simply um, the creation of, for example, a forum um, or uh, the posting of a blog. And so that was one of the, one of the, the doubts or grey areas that Section 6 was designed uh, to address. But the principal benefits of Section 6 
um, are in relation to its extra extraterritorial provisions, allowing prosecutors to address offending by Scottish residents um, when they are out with Scotland, designed for a Scottish audience. Um, and that is what the offence has been used to address hate crime posted in those circumstances. And also Section 6 significantly um, provides for a greater, uh, greater sentencing powers on the part of sentencers than the 2003 Act. And as I've already illustrated, um, we have had a case uh, where an accused person posted um, comments supportive of a prescribed terrorist organisation, namely ISIS, um, and the view of the sentencer was that the severity of, that, of those acting should be reflected in a starting point of 24 months imprisonment. That starting point for the sentencer would not have been available um, in terms of the alternative charge under the 2003 Act. Thank you, and I think it's, it's important that those advantages of Section 6 are, are highlighted. And just for clarity, how many convictions have been secured under Section 6 to date, uh, which were prosecuted on indictment? Um, that we do have figures in relation to the numbers of convictions in terms of Section 6, but that latter point, which is solemn convictions, I don't have that data to hand, but, but I can secure that data if that would be a benefit to the, to the committee. I think, I think that would convey. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank and you. Um, just on a, a similar point, um, if, if Parliament's decision is not to repeal this bill, um, ECC Higgins and um, Police Scotland, uh, and we have the chance to, to improve the legislation. I noted in Police Scotland's evidence that there is some comment about that the wording in Section 6, in the Section 6 offence, restricts Police Scotland's ability to bring charges in relation to such threatening uh, communications. I wondered, it, and I know, I know earlier you were reluctant to comment on, on, on drafting, and I appreciate if that's the case here as well, but as the point's been raised, I wondered if you wanted to elaborate on that at all, on, um, on, the, on the fact that Section 6 doesn't give you uh, give I mean, we, we have the scope that would help um, uh, use this in, in terms of a football context, for example. Um, I, th I think that's a debate for another time. Um, I think the, the, the Act in itself, in its current format, serves a purpose. The, the reality <laughs> is uh, we have very few Section 6 inquiries compared to um, you know, the wider telecommunication inquiries that we undertake. Uh, and that's something that um, I'm happy to, to elaborate by way of written note. Okay. I'd be grateful for that. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Brief Thank supplementaries, you. Mary and then um, Liam well, I have a, a more substantial question to ask if you'd prefer me to do that now or to wait. If you, if, if you want to... Well, Liam, on, on that point then. And yeah, then. that's fine. No, um, thanks very much, Kavina. Following up the, the response Mr McGeehan gave to, to, um, to, to Ben a second ago, um, through the evidence so far this morning, I think the, the gaps that are perceived to be left with the repeal of this in relation to Section 6 seem to be more significant than they are in relation to, to Section 1 offences. Uh, with, with hindsight, do you think it was perhaps a mistake to, um, to, to, to bring together in a single bill? Um, the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications, as opposed to having um, uh, two separate pieces of, of, of legislation, one dealing with a gap and one that, that, to all intents and purposes, doesn't appear to have dealt with a gap in the law. I can't really comment on the wisdom of, of a parliamentary approach in the past. What I can say is that many of the criticisms that are directed at the Act would appear to be principally directed at Section 1 as opposed to Section 6. Um, and uh, Section 6 does not appear to have attracted um, either the same degree of attention or criticism um, as Section 1. But in terms of the, the criticism, that was that, that criticism that will come from um, external stakeholders, but from your own experience of the way in which the Act is working, you would, you would argue that the Section 6 component of this, the threatening communications, is the one that has had effect and that the Section 1 element hasn't, in terms of prosecutions, had any great effect or, or, or plugged the gap that was there in the law previously? No, no, that wouldn't be my position. My position would be that both Section 1 and Section 6 have utilitarian value to prosecutors. Um, in relation to Section 1, there are alternatives. In relation to Section 6, there are alternatives. But and some of the, the deficiencies 
of those alternatives apply equally to Section 1 and Section 6. As I've indicated, both Section 1 and Section 6 have an extraterritorial power that is not available in relation to any of the alternatives. In relation to Section 1, there are alternatives available in relation to breach of the peace in Section 38. And similarly, in relation to Section 6, there's an alternative in terms of the Communications Act. The advantage and distinction to the alternative um, in the terms available to Section 1, which is breach of the peace in Section 38, is that there is no disparity in sentencing powers um, as exists uh, between the, the alternatives for uh, Section 6 uh, and Section 6 as it currently stands. Okay. Could um, existing legislation be amended so that these extra territorial powers could be incorporated? Um, existing legislation uh, doesn't have it, but could they be can, amended? Can be amended subject to parliamentary scrutiny and authority, um, but, but um, we are remembering that one of the principal alternatives offered for Section 1 is breach of the peace, mm -hmm. um, and that's a common law um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a statute. So you don't see a way around that, is that what you're saying? And no, there's no I other law that would the, cover there's, it? There's no, there's no immediate way around that, obvious to me. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary. Thank you. I just have a, a few questions. The first is about, um, obviously we have Lord Brackadale currently undertaking a review of hate, cr hate crime legislation in Scotland. Do you think that it would be more beneficial to wait for the outcome of that before proceeding with the potential repeal of this Act? Um, what I can confirm is that in response to Mr Kerr's question um, about extending this Act to parades, I chose not to contribute. And the reason I chose not to contribute is that um, my assessment was that it would be premature to conclude that the Act be extended to parades only in light of Lord Brackadale's review, which is going further than simply this Act um, and considering a wider range of issues than this Act, including, uh, for example, the extension of hate crime to other protected characteristics. Um, and I would await the outcome of Lord Brackadale's review b before offering any opinion, uh, for example, in relation to the extension of this Act to parades. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd also like to look at another area and consider the wider impact of this by focusing on some of the issues that have been raised and other evidence to the committee. Um, and particularly, I'd like to focus on some of the evidence we received from the Scottish Women's Convention in particular. Um, and they stated in their evidence that arguments for the use of breach of the peace do not send a strong enough message <coughs> of condemnation in regards to the offensive behaviour that can occur at football events because this form of abuse tends to be highly sexualized and threatening when aimed at women. It's not only highly offensive, but can lead to di directly to gendered abuse, including intimidation and rape threats. Now, do you, would you agree with that assertion in terms of the limitations of breach of the peace legislation uh, and their comments on that um, in terms of the message that that sends? And also, do you think that the 2012 Act is currently able to tackle this type of abuse and behavior in a more targeted way? Certainly the, the 2012 Act allows us to target behaviour as you've described, ma'am. Uh, and I would agree that uh, breach of the peace is, rather than limiting, it's almost a scattergun. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I joined the police, you could pretty much apply breach of the peace to any set of circumstance, <coughs> which then left my, my colleagues in Crown Office with uh, head-scratching moments about how they were going to mark a... A, a, a breach of the peace case, whereas with the, the, the 12 Act, it's very specific course of conduct. Um, so um, I, I would agree with your, your comments, yes. Okay. I would absolutely agree that legislation can be used to send a message. Um, and an example of that, of legislation being used for those purposes, um, is the Emergency Workers Scotland Act 2005. Um, it could be argued that the offences described by that Act it were already addressed by the common law um, of, for example, breach of the peace and assault. However, uh, the Act itself sent a message in relation to the way in which <coughs> offences on emergency workers would be treated by the law. Um, and therefore, um, I do think it's an entirely appropriate function of legislation to send that societal message. Thank you. Um, I, another point in the evidence that there is, uh, they say women are often the victims of sectarianism and as a, as a result often avoid public spaces on match day due to fear and that this particular type of behaviour is often linked to violence against women and can deepen the inequality between the sexes. Um, 
do you see a specific link between the type of behaviour that's seen on match days and violence against women? Um, I must confess that I haven't actually uh, looked specifically at that. Um, what we have done, um, for example, with um, old firm matches, we've monitored the, the level of domestic abuse incidents that occur uh, <coughs> in the, the, the periods after old firm matches. Um, and not having any statistics with me, the, the general uh, pattern is that it does increase. Um, now, uh, that can be a whole combination of factors. Um, but certainly the, the Act does allow us to, to target that specific behaviour um, that you address and then hopefully that could have a consequential impact on, on what happens afterwards. Okay, thank you. <coughs> right, um, Maurice Corrie. Mr. McGeehan, um, reference the conviction post-appeal situation. Uh, I understand you just said the Crown Office have not uh, commented on this aspect of the bill uh, in its written submission. Um, have you any concerns uh, about this as they're currently drafted? Um, what I would say is that this is in relation to the approach to repeal that, yeah. that is proposed. Um, I would suggest that, that it's a slightly unusual approach to repeal that is, that is proposed by the bill, and that is uh, almost that of a guillotine, um, mm -hmm. as at the date of repeal in relation to all live prosecutions. Um, that is not the traditional approach. The traditional approach would be that, that, that new prosecutions would not be possible post-repeal, but live prosecutions would not be affected. I understand that the, the policy statement for that approach is to prevent injustice, but I would reflect that, that um, only a minority um, of the charges and prosecutions relate to subsection 1-2-E, offensive behaviour, which would appear to be the subject of the most scrutiny. The remaining charges um, in terms of section 1-2-A to D relate to behaviour such as hate crime. Mm -hmm. um, and I would question um, whether a different type of injustice would be created if those prosecutions were brought to an end as a result of the approach adopted to repeal in this bill. Okay, thank you. Um, Georgia Adam, do you have a question? Yes, thank yes, you, sir. convener. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. I would just like to go through some points here. I'm, I'm a football fan myself. You know, I'll probably declare an interest at this point as convener of St Merlin Independent Supporters Association. Uh, but I go to football regularly and I, I know what it's like when St Merlin play Morton, the big game in Renfrewshire. You know, everybody starts uh, getting really passionate about the game. Mr. Adam. The whole point is, is when do we actually cross that line? You know, does this act give you the powers that you didn't have before? And when does that line cross? And what is that line when it goes from the competitiveness of two towns, two teams, to actually it becomes offensive behaviour? Where is that line and, and has it helped you? Good question. Um, police officers make judgment calls all the time. It doesn't matter whether it's in a... Uh, uh a football environment or again in Sucky Hall Street on a Saturday night when they see two people arguing they have to decide are we going to split them up, warn them and send them home or are we going to take uh, more punitive action. So one of the things that, uh, that we train our officers to do from the moment they join the police is to apply uh, discretion where appropriate but actually when it gets to the tipping point of becoming offensive uh, then that's when we need to take action. Um, that will depend on uh, the circumstances uh, of each individual match and I absolutely accept your, your point Mr Adam that football stadiums are excitable high octane places full of banter but there is a, a difference between banter between rival sets of football fans and chants uh, and songs which are designed to inflame and incite and offend. And is that not the point, ACC Higgins? Is that not the whole point of this act? Is the fact that there are certain key songs, uh, words, kind of the uh, things shouted, chants that actually do create that difference, where it crosses that line and it becomes totally unacceptable? I don't think the act creates that. I think the individuals no, no, I mean, undertaking the uh -huh. behaviour create that. Uh -huh. And we okay. apply the, the, the provisions of the Act to deal with it. Can I just say with uh, Mr McGeehan, you mentioned earlier on that uh, if the Act was repealed, 
you would have to look at other options to try and uh, work that out. Now, various, we've received various bits of evidence, like Victim Support Scotland said that it's opposed to the repeal of the 2012 Act unless there's a viable alternative to support victims of threatening communication and religious prejudice. Scottish Council of Jewish Communities have said, we are concerned the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act would send the wrong message. Is it not the case that, you know, in this modern society that we have, that if we do repeal this, not only would it be difficult for you in the Crown Office, you'd have to change things, there is a need for it. There is a need for this Act. And we can see from these groups within our communities... I think we've covered that, that in the line of question that's been asked already, Mr Adam. Can we move on? In the member in charge of the bill... And um, I now defer to him to ask any questions. OK, uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. Uh, I've got one point to ACC Higgins and three points to Mr McGeehan. Uh, ACC Higgins, in terms of the a concern was raised by Mary Fee in relation to overzealous policing uh, in relation to the Act, uh, and you responded to that. Um, I mean, one of the concerns that I have is that uh, people who are prosecuted under the Act are pursued, uh, I mean, put it charitably, but to, to say overzealously. To give an example, um, people who are first-time offenders um, are often brought to the police station and detained overnight. And that's not normally the case if somebody's a first-time offender. Uh, people who are charged with much more serious crimes uh, are allowed to, you know, to be freed until they appear in court. To give an example, um, after the cup final, you obviously published the CCTV images of <coughs> fans who were on the park and were alleged to have been involved in criminal activity. Uh, I know of a case where a young Hibs fan voluntarily um, went uh, with his lawyer to a, a police station um, after, he was, uh, after he was captured on the CCTV image. He had no previous convictions, no involvement with the police, um, but he was detained overnight before appearance in court. Why would that be the case in relation to uh, people brought to police stations under this Act? Depends the nature of what he was charged with, uh, Mr Kelly. Now, what we saw at that particular sc uh, cup final was significant and severe uh, violence and disorder, the like of which had never been seen for over 30 years. So anybody that engaged in that engaged in the highest level of disorder seen in this country for over 30 years. Now, one of the, the reasons that we would put co uh, people to court is to seek bail conditions um, imposed on the court, which might, for example, limit their ability to attend fo uh, future football matches. Um, but without knowing the, the specifics of that individual, I can only comment in, in very general terms. I'm not talking about it. I gave that as an example, yeah. but uh, I can tell you that in the, the meetings that I've held around the, the country, uh, there have been numerous examples of this, and it seems to be a regular practice that where people are detained and charged under this Act, they're detained on, over, uh, on an overnight curfew. And, and part of well, it's, it's not an overnight curfew, sir. It's, uh, it's just detained in custody to appear uh, the, the next lawful day. It's a practice we employ. Uh, I make no apologies for it because when we are dealing with the, the worst type of hate crime, then what we want to do is put control measures around individuals until the courts uh, can decide their, their guilt or innocence um, uh, and hopefully prevent them from in, uh, engaging in any more such activity until that. Um, what I would say, though, is that the, the new Criminal Justice Bill, uh, which is, is due to go live in January of next year, there's a presumption of liberation. So any person just now that comes into police custody, we do a, a custodial test uh, and uh, either release them, uh, hold them in custody, or uh, release them on a, 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 an undertaking to appear. That is going to change quite dramatically come January, where the presumption is if you come into police custody for all but the most exceptional um, high-end cases, you will be released. Mr McGeehan, if I can move on to, to yourself. Um, in terms of this issue about uh, you know, whether or not the, the, the law is effective, uh, I'm sure you'll have read the, the Law Society submission, um, and they outline the, the existing pro provisions aside from the current 2012 Act that could be used in relation to 
um, prosecution. They also point out that the definitions used in the Act uh, have led to some confusion and they, they highlight the fact that they feel the 2012 Act had to, would, uh, would continue, there will continue to be uh, appeals as because of the, the confusion over definitions in the Act. What's your response to that? Um, in relation to the availability of other offences to address the behaviour in question, um, that reflects the COPFS position also. It reflects the Lord Advocates' guidelines where we recognise that the behaviour in question may well be capable of being addressed um, as, for example, a breach of the peace or a contravention of Section 38. Our position is that the use of the Act ensures that that type of behaviour is more securely capable of being addressed um, and is not subject to the type of challenges that existed pre-2012 Act and were referred to when this bill, or sorry, when the Act uh, reflecting the bill was first being debated by the Parliament, where the then Lord Advocate referred to cases uh, where there were successful defence arguments that, for example, racist abuse or homophobic abuse did not constitute a breach of the peace due to the peculiar circumstances of football and the potential that sections of a crowd might well be inured to that type of offending behaviour. What about the specific law society point that if this act continues to be in force, the, there will continue to be uh, appeals because of the confusion over the definitions in the act? Um, I, would, I would suggest that in relation to many pieces of legislation, there will be continue to be appeals. That's entirely proper as part of a well-functioning and balanced criminal justice system, whereby laws are tested, clarified, and applied by the courts. And if I can give you an example, it, we um, experienced a similar uh, series of cases in relation to drink driving until the courts clarified the law in relation to drink driving. Offensive weapons is another example. The 2012 Act is not <coughs> unique or unusual in its scrutiny um, by the courts uh, or its consideration by the appeal courts. Uh, moving on then to section six, um, you know, which you, you've outlined your uh, position on. Can you tell us how many prosecutions and convictions there, there have been in relation to Section 6 since the Act was introduced? It, um, that information, again, is published information published by uh, the Scottish Government, and if the committee could bear with me, I'll, I'll uh, find the relevant Scottish Government publication which confirms that data. Off if it isn't um, immediately to hand, and unless you yes, you've got uh, it. I will. I'll, I'll forward it on. But, but uh, the Scottish government uh, publishes data in relation to proceedings and convictions in relation to both Section One and Section Six for the duration of the Act. Well, if it's helpful to the committee. The information is actually contained in page eleven of the financial memorandum um, to the bill under consideration. Um, it is the case that there have only been. Uh, 17 prosecutions raised under Section 6. Is it not then the case, as the police noted in their submission and other respondents have noted, that the, the threshold in terms of the legislation is, is actually too high and it's difficult to secure convictions under Section 6 as currently drafted? And, and that, is, that is evidenced by the fact that over uh, the period that the Act's been enforced, there's only been 17 uh, convictions for all? Uh, no, I wouldn't draw a conclusion uh, from the numbers of convictions um, that there is a particular difficulty in connection with Section 6. As I've indicated, Section 6 actually provides um, a power and a tool to prosecutors that would not otherwise be available in relation to extraterritorial activity uh, and also offending that potentially merits a solemn sentence. But, but surely um, if you look at you know, threatening communications, particularly in relation to online activity, that's something that's really grown um, over the past five years. But when we actually look at statistics, the fact that there's only been 17 cases brought indicates that both police and prosecutors don't have any confidence in this legislation to secure convictions. Um, I wouldn't draw a conclusion that prosecutors don't have any confidence in Section 6. Well, they're, they're obviously not using it. 
they're using it in a limited number of cases where yeah, that's the appropriate charge. And, and again, those cases are where, for example, there is an extraterritorial element that cannot be addressed through any other legisla legislative tool. Moving on then to the issue that uh, Mr McGregor raised about um, diversions. Um, the, the latest statistics show that 31% uh, in, in relation to convictions, 31% of them relate to under 20s. Do you think that's a desirable outcome of Scottish Government justice policy? Um, I'm an independent public prosecutor. I cannot comment on Scottish Government policy. In terms of... For the, the Minister, Mr Kelly. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, do you have any other questions? Yeah, sure. Just in, in relation to the diversion tactics, you said that uh, the casework instructions in relation to that, the Act you know, were very specific in terms of setting out that you know, diversions should be used. But we, we see from the evidence discussed earlier that that's only happened in two cases. But why is that? Um, well, again, um, I don't think the evidence is that, that that has only happened in two cases. Um, the evidence referred to was a response and FOI uh, request at September 2016, and I've offered to obtain up-to-date information in relation to diversion. I've also indicated some of the possible reasons for a low number of diversions, which include the fact that previously the diversion scheme was very focused on sectarian behaviour and did not reflect the wide spectrum of offending behaviour addressed by the Act. In addition, um, the case mark instructions do encourage prosecutors to use diversion in appropriate cases. The fact that diversion may not be appropriate may result from, for example, the accused's record of offending behaviour or the risk of the accused committing further offences without actions such as a football banning order. It may also be suggested that the fact that diversion is not used is reflective of a proportionate approach being adopted by the police. We would normally expect to use diversion um, in relation to offences at the lower end of the offending spectrum. If those offences uh, were not being um, or were being addressed by the police, for example, through their existing powers with the application of fixed penalties, then we might well expect to see low levels of diversion by prosecutors. Just to be clear, the information that was published in response to the FOI in September 2016 was accurate at that time? It was, yes. Thank you. Just before we conclude, um, you mentioned, Ms McGeehan, that it's not unusual maybe for new offences to cause confusion and that the courts generally sort that out. However, we've heard from numerous sheriffs um, that uh, the, the legislation is confusing and flawed, so it would seem the courts are not sorting the, the legislation out. Um, again, in relation to uh, response from sheriffs, I, I would refer to the 2015 academic survey which included interviews with sheriffs um, and that, that survey indicated a much more diverse range of opinions on the part of sheriffs in relation to the Act and its value. Well, does it not at the very least say there's a diversion of opinion amongst the judiciary and that in itself cannot be welcome or good or help to, to ease the confusion? Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't conclude from a diverse range of opinions on the part of judiciary that that, that that represents a wrong in the part of, for example, legislation. I would suggest a diverse range of opinions is healthy. If it's um, diverse and both opinions are diametrically opposed, that isn't healthy because you've got a polarisation of views. Um, again, I, I think a diverse range of opinions um, is not unique uh, and specific to the 2012 Act. A polarisation of views? Um, again, I, I wouldn't, well, I cannot speak for the judiciary um, and the range of their opinions and whether or not they are polarised in relation to the 2012 Act alone um, or in relation to other statutes or offences. But offences. that can't be a good place to be. In principle, that can't be a good place to be if there is this confusion. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, well, I would, I would accept that if there was a consensus of a wrong that required to be addressed, that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. right, that concludes our question. Can I thank the witnesses and suspend briefly to allow the change of witnesses and um, a five-minute comfort break.
I welcome our second panel, Jeanette Finlay, Paul Quigley, Fans Against Criminalisation, Simon Barrow, Chair, and Paul Goodwin, Chief Executive of Scottish Football Supporters Association, and Andrew Jenkin, Head of Supporters Direct Scotland. Um, can I again thank the witnesses for the written submit, uh, submissions? These are tremendously helpful to the committee in seeing some of this in advance of our questioning. And with that, I new move straight to questions. Rona. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, can I ask you, we've heard from the um, previous panel that um, existing pre-existing legislation wouldn't be sufficient to deal with some of the behaviour which falls within the 2012 Act, um, in particular the Section 6. What's your view on that? Does that concern you that there's going to be a gap left? Whoever would like to... I'm happy to answer that. Yes, yeah. yes, go ahead. Um, well, what certainly what's been heard this morning is uh, conflicts with the submission of the Law Society of Scotland who take the view that there would be no gap in the Act. And I would also refer you to the evidence that you just heard, where um, ACC Higgins said, in the absence of this Act, young men would have been arrested and charged with breach of the peace. So it doesn't appear to us that there is I'm necessarily... I'm talking specifically about Section 6, not, not breach of the peace. Sorry, Section 6? Six. Section 6, yes. Well, as you've already heard, Section 6 is rarely used. It's so, you know, how would you, f you breach that gap of... You know, allowing people to send insightful communications, is that all right with you? It's or? not the role of fans' organisations to determine uh, how uh, a legisl legislature deals with communications acts. I understand uh, that. Certainly not our view on that. And, you know, yep. if, if there needs to be other legislation, then that other legislation should not have been attached to something which only relates to football fans. Now, I accept that Section 6 does not just relate to football mm -hmm. fans, mm -hmm. but there seems to be... It's part of the whole muddled original drafting of this legislation that you have Section 1, which draws up a list of offences which applies only in the context of a regulated football max, match, and Section 6, which is an entirely separate matter which applies to everybody, and is rarely used. So it seems to me that there was a problem with the original draft, and, and of course that could be looked at and corrected you know, after this act is repealed, which of course is what we hope will happen. Okay, anyone else like to comment? I think just to, just to comment that uh, that question illustrates that it's important to look at this issue in the context of Lord Brackadale's hate crime uh, legislation review. Um, and I think one of our, our concerns is to look at it in that wider context. Um, obviously, the feedback that we get back from fans, and I should say that the Scottish Football Sports Association hasn't done a specific survey on that issue, but we do receive feedback, is a concern about uh, what appears to be the targeting of football fans in particular. So I think those issues need to be addressed in relation to uh, the wider review. And obviously, it's important that... Um, one looks at how you deal with this kind of behaviour. Football fans um, do not want to see this kind of behaviour. There is, in Scottish criminal law, currently statute, uh, statutory aggravations based on race, religion, disability, <coughs> etc. Um, but the question of how it all fits together is not something that we claim legal expertise in, but is something we're, we're concerned to see addressed. Okay. Yes. We don't have any research on Section 2, as that wasn't just specifically for football supporters. We do have research on supporters' views on Section 1, of which 84% of supporters do not believe that any conduct yeah, we'll, we'll, currently We'll subject. go on to that later. I'm just specifically okay. I was at that question asking about Section 6. Um, Mr Goodwin, do you have any? No further comments. Okay. Can I, can I move on then at the moment and just ask you, um, do you feel that behaviour at football generally has changed since the introduction of the 2012 Act? And if so, in what way has it made your experience of attending football more or less enjoyable? I think that um, assistant chief constable Higgins has made the remark, um, certainly in the past, that there has been improvement over the last five years. Um, but my understanding, he does so without you know any sort of substantive, substantive basis uh, to do so. Now, we've experienced it from the role of fans. Um, I'm obviously not quite old enough to have experienced football in the 60s and 70s and 80s, 
Um, but I do accept that, you know, some types of behaviours, racism, sectarianism, was all too commonplace, just as it was um, perhaps too accepted by society at the time. But Celtic, um, sorry, football doesn't operate um, in a bubble from society. It reflects society. So as those types of things became less acceptable in society, so too became less acceptable with football. What we've seen um, in the last five years, in my opinion, isn't an improvement in terms of um, you know, the, the behaviour of fans or the lessening of certain uh, singing or anything like that. What we've seen is a breakdown uh, in the relationship between fans and the police, and that's what um, has been caused by this legislation. It's not, I don't think that's quite what we heard from ACC Higgins, but uh, mm -hmm. that's your view. Yeah, that's Anyone right. else? Uh, yeah, just to make a, make a comment and to set it in context, um, I've not been following Scottish football for, for 47 years. I'm a, a season ticket holder at Dumbarton, um, and over the last five years I've been to all but four of the 42 professional grounds in Scotland as well as to junior football. And the answer to the question really depends on the context in which you operate. I mean, at Dumbarton we occasionally see a police officer. Um, there have been some incidents that have needed uh, dealing with um, when in recent seasons we've had larger clubs there but the experience will be quite different in, in different parts of football and you, you've already heard uh, one experience in, based I think on some of the larger clubs um, I was talking recently to um, a woman who's been a long-term fan of Hearts and she felt that things had improved um, uh, since the legislation had come into effect that it, it had uh, created a, an atmosphere where there was an ability to challenge abuse and that women and families in particular felt more welcome. On the other hand, I then had another conversation with someone from another club who had diametrically opposed views to that as well and said that it had created an atmosphere where there was greater suspicion between um, police and fans. So I think it is a mixed picture from that point of view. Before I bring someone else in, can I put it to you then, just generally as a panel, that Stonewall Scotland, Equality Network, Victim Support and women's organisations take the view that um, they, they fear the repeal of this Act, they don't want it. Does that concern you? Certainly, it would concern many football fans if um, sexist and racist abuse, sectarianism, uh, hate speech of any kind, uh, homophobia and so on, was, was tolerated in football and fans are actively working to, uh, uh, to, to combat those uh, tendencies within in some sections of our game and some sections of wider society. The question as to the efficacy of the Act is obviously a, a disputed one from that point of view, but we also recognise that, uh, on the other hand, Liberty and uh, lawyers and other organisations are concerned about its uh, effect on free speech, so there are conflicting views about this. Uh, I think that the key thing that we would want to say is that um, whatever happens moving forward, it's vital that we within football take greater responsibility uh, for the, the atmosphere that exists um, for the sense of community, for the way that we address disorder, etc. And one of the things that we have uh, put forward in terms of the Scottish Football Supporters Association is the need for policing by community consent, actually drawing together community groups, women's groups, fans groups, uh, stewarding organisations and police in particular context to look at what is happening in a particular situation because, as I've already said, it, it varies very widely across Scottish football Football, but to find solutions that are based on the ground and relate that, obviously, to um, the provision of, of, of hate legislation and how that's dealt with by police courts, etc. Anyone else? Jeanette? Because, obviously, that would be very concerning, and I've read those submissions uh, in some detail, and I've also uh, kept a track of the statistics um, over the years, so if there was any basis to those concerns, then clearly I would be concerned as well. However, I think you'll find that in the entire period of the Act, I think there's been two charges which related to homophobia. There have been none which have related to, um, uh, I don't know whether it be called misogyny or sexism, I don't know what that would be called, but there are none that relate to that. Um, and I don't see in all of those submissions, those organisations conceded that the Act 
was not being used in relation to their protected characteristics. So if there is a problem, and clearly there is a problem more widely in Scottish society which affects those groups, I don't know that there's any evidence that's been presented that that's particular to football, but if there is a problem, then this Act is not dealing with it. I'm not sure how worthwhile it is to look back retrospect retrospectively, and I'm not sure if you're inferring there's no basis to their concerns, because there clearly are concerned, there must be reasons for it, and it may be that in future and just ongoing, if, if they're going, they just don't, they don't enjoy it, they don't feel safe, and they feel the repeal of this Act would be detrimental to their enjoyment of it. Well, I don't know if that's the case. And well, I don't know if it, reflects more, I don't know if it reflects more widely, because I was unable to establish, and we did try and correspond uh, with the Scottish Women's Convention in particular, and they were unable to provide us with any details about where they had collected that evidence or how many women it represented or the age ranges or any basic statistics around that. So we did examine it, because we did look at it, um, but we were unable to establish, um, you know, really any... Wouldn't you accept basis. as a general principle, you know, that... Would that, I accept as a general would, principle yes, that, that women that shouldn't fear, be afraid to go to football? Yes. No, no, that, that, that they fear if the Act is repealed, they will feel less protected. I know that there are organisations who have written that as a submission. Yes. I'm not clear what lies behind and how much evidence there is to support the, the submission that they've put. OK, thank you. Um, supplementary, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, just... Uh, ACC Higgins was very clear that behaviour changed, and I think, Mr Barrow, you, you would agree with that. Uh, but is there any evidence from the groups you represent that that change in behaviour is in response to this legislation? Uh, and flowing from that, ACC Higgins was saying that this legislation puts it in the front of the public mind. Uh, but have you any idea how many fans actually knew about this act in order to moderate their behaviour? One of those things that we're just football fans. We're not lawyers. We're not experts. We just want to go and watch a game of football. Mm -hmm. And I think over the, the course of, I am old enough to, to you know football in the bad times, not just in Scotland, but also in England where I, I lived and worked. I think there's been a dramatic change. Uh, society itself has actually done things. I know my stood with my father and my grandfather shouting things that would be unacceptable in this day and age. Uh, and I think the generations as we move on uh, have taken that on board. And we've also been supplemented by really important campaigns like Show Racism, the Red Card. Interestingly, going on back to the, the issue with homophobia, Scottish football is one of the only countries that didn't actually been pushing things forward with uh, the, the Rainbow Laces campaign. Until this season, it's been running in England for seven years, and it's taken till now for football itself to actually pick that up and actually run with it. So I think there's always going to be these issues all round about it. And I think a lot of it comes down to football itself as an industry and as a business taking a look at it. We are the, the loyal customers of that, of that industry. We're not the experts in the legal framework. And I think the clubs themselves and the, the football authorities uh, have to take responsibility and actually push the, tripe, the, the appropriate messages through the game. Uh, to help and support the fans. But did the behaviour get better because of the no. act? No, it's, it's immaterial. It's immaterial? It's immaterial. Is, is that view shared by the panel? I would say from our, our research, we asked the question in the, the National Supporters Survey this year about the offensive behaviour and whether it had been effective in preventing unacceptable conduct. And all I've referred to is, is the 12,000 people that filled it in, and 71% felt it wasn't effective in preventing unacceptable conduct. And just the second part of my question then, do football fans know about this legislation? Society, you're going to have people that are, are more informed of certain issues than others. And, but I would say, as a, as a consensus, a lot of supporters are informed and know the framework well. Um, a lot of, of, of replied to surveys and consultations on the matter. So, absolutely. Come back to what you said, because your question seems to assume that there was very poor behaviour prior to the 2012 Act and that <coughs> behaviour has improved. Well, certainly that's the kind of evidence that you've heard here this morning from ACC I didn't Higgins. mean to imply that incidentally. But, 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 okay. but in actual fact, the, um, there's very, there's very um, uh, little evidence to suggest that there is a behaviour problem in Scottish football grounds and certainly hasn't been for a very, very long time. If you take, for instance, uh, religious aggravation charges, which would have been the charges which should have been used in cases of sectarianism, 
um, you know, uh, prior to the 2012 Act. In the two years leading up to the introduction of the Act, uh, the proportions which took place at football grounds were 12.9% and 7.6% respectively. So the vast and overwhelming majority of problems with sectarian type offences, and that's just one of the offences, uh, are taking place somewhere else other than football grounds. So when we're asked, has behaviour improved? I suppose our response to that is, on a long-term trend, clearly, you know, since the 1980s, it has. But, but, but there wasn't really a problem with behaviour in Scottish football grounds in 2011. Uh, and the evidence suggests that. There was very little disorder, very little violence, very little of anything. Scottish football grounds are extremely safe places to be. Very briefly, Fulton, supplementary. Yeah. Um, my question later, which I think will be covered. Um, and I think it's just a good place to come in. It, um, I, what do the panel think about um, the, the message that a repeal of the Act, if it, if it goes ahead, will send out to fans? Uh, and what message in, generally in society? And if I just give an example, just last week, uh, the whole parliament, every, every party, um, agreed to the, the stage one principles of the domestic abuse legislation and, and part of that is also about sending a message out that domestic abuse is not acceptable in our society so as we heard in the earlier panel for those of you who were in uh, legislation can be also to send a message what do you think what message do you think would be sent out if, if the repeal uh, goes through well to, to respond to that uh, I'm not a lawyer I happen to be married to a lawyer the whole question about uh, the extent to which law is there to send out messages or actually to provide an effective framework for dealing with order issues is one in which there's a, a, a variety of questions. I think um, many fans will feel that this legislation uh, targets them unfairly, is directed towards them unfairly. So I think one of the signals that, that, that they might get is that, that you know, that's not so much the, the case. Um, and I think primarily relating your question to the previous question, what makes fans um, feel safe at football is the way that clubs uh, deal with the, the whole situation, with the way that fan groups do, etc. That's where the primary messages are. So, for example, at my own club, you know, I have heard instances of, uh, you know, chants or comments which are, you know, sexist and homophobic and so on. And one of the responses of our um, supporters' trust is to identify who's doing those things, to try and take them into the community suite, have a chat with them, you know, introduce them some, to someone to whom that is threatening or of, uh, offensive, and, you know, in other words, to take active responsibility for what goes on. So I think the primary messages that fans pick up are ones as to how things are dealt with, uh, uh, you know, on the ground in the local situation. As to their responses to the presence or absence of legislation, I think it's difficult to draw definite conclusions either way about that. If I can just come in on that. Um, I think that what's established, or has been established here this morning, that there would be no gap in law in terms of um, the kind of hate crime that we're talking about, racism, sectarianism, homophobia, those kind of actions, those kind of behaviours would still be illegal. Um, it's my understanding that ourselves as a campaign group against the uh, legislation and any other kind of prominent uh, critics of the legislation um, do so on account of the fact that this bill is by definition discriminatory. It creates an offence which only applies to football fans. I don't think anyone is defending the types of behaviours um, which you know we've already covered, which would still be um, <coughs> illegal. Um, the message that would be sent is that uh, football fans would no longer, um, as they have been under this act, be unfairly and unduly criminalised, specifically in a way that wider society wouldn't be. So is it, is it fair to say um, from, from that submission there that it, it's not so much the act that, that you are opposed to, it's the fact that it is relating to football? So if, the, if I think it was mentioned in the earlier panel, if the act, uh, theoretically speaking, was extended to say, for example, um, the offensive behaviour at sports grounds, for example, uh, and other venues. And that, that's just off the top of my head. That's not any. W w would you be comfortable with that then? So the what I would say is that we began as an organisation round about uh, the kind of summer of 2011 when this bill was being proposed as a, an emergency bill um, following the so-called shame game that took place um, earlier that year. Our opposition to the Act then hasn't changed all that much. There are two primary reasons for our opposition to the Act. The first of which 
is that, as I've said, it creates a piece of legislation which only applies to football fans, and we believe that laws should apply universally. Um, but secondly to that, we also think that to create an offence which criminalises something as subjective as offensiveness um, presents a broader danger to freedom of uh, speech and freedom of expression. So on that basis, we would be opposed to uh, legislation that, you know, for example, would um, criminalise certain uh, you know, offensive behaviours um, out with um, hate crime and other uh, arenas or uh, locuses. Okay, so you don't, you, the panel, um, this panel aren't saying there's any particular risk if this bill is repealed. I mean, obviously the panel members here today are particularly well informed, but there isn't a risk that um, fans uh, in stadiums up and down the country um, could get the message that, that, that it's okay to sing sectarian songs as a result of the publicity and the, the outcome of the, of the bill being repealed. Another line of questioning. I'll just give you don't mind we'll and I'm willing to satisfy my question later as well. Yeah. Uh, brief supplementary, just, just to clarify what my colleague has been talking about, very briefly, would you be in favour of this Act if it was called the Offensive Behaviour and Threatening Communication Scotland Bill and take out the words at football? No. 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 That view of everyone? A starting point in trying to restore the faith that um, some of the football fans have. I think a lot of this is down to horrific PR uh, right from the start, from we talked about emergency legislation coming in. Um, so I, I think from a, a football fan's perspective, from many clubs, it's a, they don't understand why it was there in the first place, they don't understand the benefit of it, and they feel you know, either rightly or wrongly targeted. Uh, I mean, certainly our colleagues, we're part of Football Supporters Europe and part of our submissions you saw, is they, you know, they were surprised that in countries like Poland, where they have horrific uh, violence and issues with flares and all sorts of things, Turkey, another example, there isn't a specific act. Um, so from a, a global perspective, from a football, this is the only bit of legislation we can find that is so targeted to football fans. And, and a society that we've got in Scotland, you know, pff, is that is that right? Um, so, but in terms of the principles of the things that some of it's trying to do in the other areas, of course, you know, we would happily have it called whatever it needs to be called. Okay, thank you, uh, Stuart Stevens. Uh, just for clarity, I'm not speaking much. My voice isn't working very well. Um, I just wanted to be clear, Mr. Quigley, you suggested there was behaviours caught by the legislation that we're considering that should not be caught by any legislation. That's what I appeared to hear you say. Can you give me an example of a behaviour caught by the current legislation that you do not believe should be legislated in any context? Because yeah. that's what you appeared to say to me. Yeah, of course. So um, there's been, throughout the course of our campaign, not all, uh, only have we campaigned against the legislation, but we've also offered help and support to people who have been charged under it. Um, so we've kind of dealt hey, with... Do forgive me. I want to just focus one, very one narrowly. Case, that's the exactly what I'm getting to. Okay, so um, there was a Rangers fan who was arrested for holding a banner which simply said, Ax the Act. For example, there was a Motherwell fan who was arrested, held in Greenock Prison for four days uh, and then convicted of singing a song that simply pre um, included profanity about a rival team. I don't think that that's proportionate and I don't think that's um, worthy of a criminal conviction. But, but, but just my very precise point is right. you're saying that should not be criminalised yeah. in any context, yeah. whether at a football match or elsewhere. Well, yes. I just want to be clear say, what you were saying. What I would say is that, um, you know, if, if, for example, you're talking about singing a song, that's obviously, um, you know, the type of behaviour that would go on at a football match. You know, you wouldn't typically walk down the street and sing a song which would include profanity, and that would obviously be slightly different. But within the context of a football match, um, I don't think those types of behaviours should be criminalised. Morris? Thank you, Mina. Um, Good morning, panel. Um, I wonder if Mr. Barrow or uh, Mr. Goodwin would elaborate on what the SF, SF, SFSA means by divisions and how do you both see these being overcome? Sorry, I'm, uh, d divisions in, I'm not... I, I well, in your, in your submission, you talk yeah. about divisions, right? Um, and what do we mean, what do you mean by divisions? Divisions. Specifically? Mm -hmm. what, what, what part of the submission are you referring to? I mean, there are already too yeah. many divisions in the game we love and something requires to be put in place to show the majority that we understand the problem 
and work together to resolve it. Right. That wasn't our submission, but um, so it's a little difficult to... to it's to from Mr Goodwin, I think, on, as and as an both of you, I think, are repre yeah. representing the Scottish Football Supporters yeah. Association, yeah. so perhaps it's better Sorry, directed I, I, I to Mr Goodwin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, obviously, there are divisions. I mean, the, the very nature of football itself, it's uh, divided by our loyalties. We heard about the divisions between um, rival fans. Um, divisions uh, are, thank you very much, um, right from the very, very top of the game. We're in a period of angst where uh, fans' representations are being generally ignored for many, many years, many, many seasons. Uh, we don't have a route and an access to actually have uh, um, a say in the game. Uh, that's not just ourselves, but that also applies to the, the Holy Trinity, as Bill Shankly once quoted, the players, the managers and the coaches. According to him, nothing else in football matters. Uh, sadly, uh, from our game, we're in a, a place where any opinions that we have, uh, and this is a very rare occasion, that we actually get a chance to come and uh, express those opinions, they tend to be treated in a vacuum. So um, the opinion we have are different, they're varied, um, and uh, the big division in the game is that uh, as the game changes and becomes uh, more corporate, more global, and in a different environment, the, the communities and societies that the, many of these clubs have represented beautifully over the years uh, has changed. So that's maybe, it would be the, the reference to the divisions. Can I ask supplementary on that one? Okay. Yeah. Um, would, would therefore the repeal of this act um, contribute to overcoming these divisions that you speak of? I, I, I don't think it's connected. I really don't. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, okay. just to say, and, and I apologise for the distinction there between a, a group submission and mm -hmm. uh, an individual submission. But, I mean, uh, j just to say that one of the things that uh, that we've done very recently and we'll be publishing the results of this next month is the first benchmarking survey on governance in Scottish football which looks at how, um, as Paul has just said, um, fans, players, officials and others with stakeholders in the game what their view is about how the game is run and that will also enable us to begin to look at some of the differences of opinion, opinion on a variety of issues um, but you know that's the way we would see that, that moving forward. As to divisions in relation to the review of this particular piece of legislation, the thing we're conscious of in pre presenting our evidence to you is that fans do have different opinions. The great majority of fans from uh, the, the research that we've done do have severe questions about this act or are opposed to it, but others are obviously very concerned about the issues it is intended to address and we recognise that the intention is good and that these issues do need, these behaviours do need challenging and fans themselves have to be central to doing that. Thank you. Ben McPherson. Vina, uh, good morning panel. Uh, like all of you, I love football. I played it a lot growing up to a quite a high level and I've been to games across Scotland from Edinburgh derbies to old firm matches and, and lower leagues. And what, what I find difficult about the submissions that we've heard so far from yourselves is I don't know what behaviours you want to do that this Act is preventing, and particularly uh, Paul Quigley and, and Jeanette Finlay. I mean, what, is this, what, what are the obstructions to you being fans, supporting your club, participating in the the beautiful game and, 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 and being part of the experience at a football stadium, what, 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 what does this prohibit? We are actually moving on to the that we're going to come on later, but carry on with Well, it's your, connected your, to, to, to this yeah. line of questioning. I'm, ha I'm happy to reply to that. The point, I think, that you're misunderstanding is that the behaviours that are prevented are any behaviour which any police officer regards as being potentially offensive to a person who may not be there, who may not ever know about it, and that's sufficient to bring a charge. That charge, you've heard this morning, is almost always preceded with by the Crown Office. They prosecute it in almost all cases. That then requires people to attend uh, court on three or more occasions, sometimes considerably more, over quite long periods of time, longer than normal, as the Stirling research that the Scottish Government um, commissioned found. And so my concern is that you could be doing anything which a police officer 
might consider to be offensive. And we've already heard that police officers in Scotland have to be educated as to what, and trained as to what might be offensive. Now, if that doesn't raise alarm bells for people, that you have to actually train police officers to discover what might be offensive. So that's the problem. I am not prevented from doing anything that I want to do when I go to a football match. But what I do see is young people, by and large, young men, by and large, being charged, not necessarily being convicted, because the conviction rate is very low, but being charged and being put through all of that disruption for doing things which, on any view, uh, should not be a criminal offence in a civilised modern democracy. So when this act catches racism, sexism, homophobia and sectarian abuse, it really you're supportive does. of that, though? When it, it does, really does. No, I'm sorry, that's insulting. It really does capture but, those but, things. But when Look it does, at the statistics. Are you, are you supportive? To complete his question, and then you'll get a full opportunity yeah. to okay. answer. So, uh, I mean, uh, when it addresses the fact that there are flags and banners and songs and chants in support of terrorist organisations, are you supportive of that? Look, the question that, you ask this, that you're asking me now is, do I like sectarianism? Do I like hate crime? Do I like bigotry? That's what you've just asked me. No, I don't. Okay? And make that clear. I'm, I'm what I'm not, telling I'm you is you this legislation does not address those things. This, you heard this morning evidence that said, first of all, that the diversion scheme doesn't work because in actual fact that's really only aimed at sectarianism. That really only captured two people in its whole first year. That sectarianism is the minority of the charges. The gentleman from the Crown Office said it's the minority of the charges which are brought up in relation to this Act. So what this Act is capturing is not hate crime. And there's legislation to cover that. What this Act is capturing is behaviour which a police officer might find, by and large, of course, I'm not saying there's never been any hate crime captured by, of course there has. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, what it's capturing is behaviour which a police officer, trained or otherwise, thinks might be offensive to somebody who's there or not there. And on the basis of that, young people's lives are disrupted. Now, there must be a way to have legislation which targets genuine problematic behaviour, which does not leave citizens, just because they happen to be attending a football match, wide open to that kind of consequence. Um, just if I may elaborate, con yeah. convener, uh, thank you for that, that explanation. I, I guess to, 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 <coughs> to get back to the, con the conceptual point that I'm making, though, which is, I think is an important one in, in terms of legislation, is that when, you know, so I appreciate you, you have views and, and you've, you've put them in, in, in your submissions and today that there's the, this act has been used in a in a way that you think is disproportionate but when this act in the in the views of uh, of the law prosecutes on the basis of discriminatory behavior of chants that are would be unacceptable in in, in, the, in the eyes of, of most and behavior associated with that negative aspect of Scottish football, which is undoubtedly there, and we've all experienced it, those who've gone to football matches, and, 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 and children are subjected to listening to it when they go to football matches, and women, and, 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 and wider society as a whole. It surely you must be supportive of the act when it does address that demeaning and unacceptable behaviour. No, I'm supportive of people who engage in hate crime being brought to justice. I am not supportive of, the, of this act being used for that purpose. Apart from anything else, this act, the act has a very poor conviction rate. So if you genuinely want to address real offending behaviour, real hate crime, then charge them under legislation which have some prospect of success. And almost every other possible uh, alternative has a better prospect of success than this act. M Mr Bow, did you want to come yes. in at this point? comment on it. I think, I think the difficulty that we're facing here is, is the, the distinction and how it's made between problematic and offensive behaviour on the one hand, behaviour that, that, that clearly wouldn't be acceptable in other parts of society and many of us say isn't acceptable in football either. I mean, it's clearly that sexism, racism, uh, sectarianism and homophobia and other behaviours of that kind need to be challenged and rooted out. There's no question about that. There's a question about 
when speech re reaches a point that it should actually be criminalised. And whilst there's some clarity that it should clearly be criminalised when it's, it's uh, threatening and violent and so on, um, it, it's often difficult to draw those kind of distinctions. I think, for example, uh, you know, every week uh, as I attend home matches, there's someone who sits not that far from me um, whose enjoyment of the main activity that he seems to go there uh, to, to uh, actively participate in, which is criticising the officials, is occasionally interrupted by football. And some of the way in which he criticises the, the officials is rude and offensive to many people. And the way that we deal with that um, is partly by moving some people, but also by directly challenging that behaviour, and we have been able to, to temper that individual's behaviour and so on. Now, should his behaviour be criminalised, I would say that's not the, the helpful or appropriate way, but clearly there is behaviour where people are directly threatened, where there's uh, you know, a clear public order situation where the law has to step in, and it's about the distinction between those two things, and the difficulty at the moment is people feel that that distinction is not operatively and at a legal level clear enough. Can I, can I just ask a quick supplementary on that and, 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 and genuinely a question in good faith to, to Paul Quigley and, and Jeanette Finlay. Since this act, um, since the enactment of this piece of legislation, have football fans in your experience been less reluctant to engage in the sort of chanting and uh, singing of songs, display of certain symbols and, and slogans? that would be seen as offensive or supportive of violence or uh, celebrate or mock I've not seen historical that. examples of, of Personally, I couldn't see violence. any improvement, and I don't think there would be much evidence that suggests that there has been an improvement. Anything to add? Okay. Thank you, Thank convener. you. Uh, Mary. Thank you, um, Convener. The, the previous panel, um, we posed the question to them um, to ask their, their view on the guidelines that, that go with the 2012 um, Act, if they thought the guidelines were, were suitable, if they thought they, uh, they captured offensive behaviour correctly. What's this panel's view? The Advocates' Guidelines? Yes. The 2015 ones. Well, I suppose the difficulty where you would see that coming to fore is in terms of how, that, how that's then dealt with in the courts. I've already mentioned the very low mm. conviction rates, which would suggest there's a problem. I've also, we also heard this morning uh, from both the Crown Office representative and the uh, Police Scotland representative about um, the nature of the bill, having to, um, and having, you know, the, the legal test in terms of inciting public disorder and it being offensive to a reasonable <coughs> person. The Crown Office representative uh, clearly didn't have information about appeals, but we do. And the appeals, the Crown Office appeals against the uh, Joseph Cairns case and the, uh, uh, the Walsh and Donnelly case, which are the two main um, Crown Office appeals against um, person not being found guilty. Expanded and explained and clarified those terms. And the two things I think that are important about that is one is that um, uh, the reasonable person was redefined as being, if you can, if you give me a minute I'll be able to tell you what it was. Uh, it said the law lords found in the Walsh and Donnelly case. Thus, the Act distinguishes between, on the one hand, a reasonable person and, on the other, a person likely to be incited to public disorder. It may be that a person likely to be incited to public disorder is of a more volatile temperament than a reasonable person, or, to use the language of the sheriff, an uninitiated member of the public. The person likely to be incited to public disorder may have particular interests and particular knowledge. He may have particular views about the songs and questions or those who sing them. So, in other words, the leading case in this regard makes it clear that <coughs> it's not a reasonable person that we're talking about, it's an unusually volatile person. The other issue related to whether public disorder would take place, and that same judgment makes clear 
that not only does public disorder not have to take place, but the person who might have been incited to public disorder does not have to be there and does not ever have to find out about whether the thing that might have incited them to take... So the Lord Advocate's guidelines might, on the face of it, have seemed you know, a reasonable set of guidelines about when uh, people should be charged. But I think the outcome of case law has, has shown that they're, they're not adequate, but I think that's because the law in its original drafting was not adequate. It was never clear, and therefore I'm not sure what guidelines, you know, all due respect to the Lord Advocate, what guidelines he could have produced that would have allowed proper and sensible interpretation of the law. Okay, thank you. Do any of the other panel members have any um, comments on the guidelines? Because I want to move on and ask something else. Clear on the guidelines, but generally there's a lot of amb ambiguity as to what constitutes a criminal offence under the under the Act. I think that's the only thing I would add to that. Okay. The fans against criminalisation um, submission spoke of genuine problems within football stadiums. Could you perhaps explain to committee what you mean by that? We referred to. Uh, sorry, what page are you looking at? I don't have a page number at the moment, but you did. You spoke about genuine problems within football, football stadiums. I mean, oh, in, okay. in general terms. I mean, in, in, in any context where you have large crowds of people, whether that be a football match, any other sporting match, a concert, a demonstration, a parade, anything, it's clearly the case that there can be incidences of criminal behaviour. And so I suppose our view is that before the 2012 Act, clearly some criminal acts did take place in football stadiums. It would be very surprising if that were not the case. There were very few, but they were dealt with under the law and dealt with by you know, the police officers in that case. So to the extent that there are uh, any genuine issues of criminality, that might be, it could be assault, it could be whatever it might be, um, then you know, the police should deal with that under the existing law and they clearly have the ability to do that. But, but do you think, because of the 2012 Act, there is less focus on other issues and more focus on well, the government's specific own, The government's example. own research found that. The government's own research found that there was a danger that because there was the focus on the stadium, and I suppose uh, focus being the word in question because the unit that's, uh, of the police that are used uh, to deal with this is called the focus group, but because of the focus on that, on, on football stadia, then actually there had been, in some cases, a little bit of a rise up again of some disorder away from football stadia that weren't being captured um, by the Act. So that, in fact, football res uh, sorry, police resources were being improperly directed to where the problem was not <coughs> and away from any potential problems that might be taking place elsewhere. Can you give any specific examples of that kind of behaviour? In inside but stadia? Or? Outside, when you, when you said that the, the police attention was taken away from other incidents, can you give an example of what kind of incident you would mean, or behaviour you would mean? Well, I was referring to the I was referring to the um, Stirling research, but it could be you know low level minor sort of disorder, you know um, football casual type of thing, which is is very limited in scope, but. Um, uh, the Chief Constable referred this morning to some arrests that took place uh, and there was a, a melee or a rami somewhere uh, involving Airdrie and Hamilton supporters at some point. That did not take place inside the football stadium. Okay. That took place somewhere else. And has the changing in, in the police operation at football matches had any impact on, on fans and their experience of enjoying the game? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think way. that... Um, I think that the kind of fan experience has been dramatically changed as a result of this act. Um, now, I understand what Mr Barrow is saying in terms of how those experiences may differ depending on you know the, the club and the size of the club that uh, each fan supports. But certainly my own experience <coughs> as a Celtic fan, um, you know, from the, the second that you get off a bus um, in any city over the um, country, uh, you know, you're filmed from the moment you get off and you're um, often... Uh, fans often feel, I think, at this point, um, intimidated from the second that they get off the bus to the second they get, they get back on it. Um, they're subject to the type of surveillance that just didn't exist, that they just didn't have to experience um, pre-2012. Um, and I think that it's correct that there is now a suspicion between fans and police. I think that 
the relationship is broken down, and I don't think that that's been in anybody's um, interest. Okay. And do you think the police have been justified in, in the way the, the police matches now? What I would say is it, it's it's quite a difficult thing to police because, as I say, you know, offensiveness is, is subjective, and I understand that uh, the witnesses this morning said it. You know, it's it's not um, applied arbitrarily, but I, I can't see how it possibly could not be because um, even Mr Higgins said that you know if a full stand um, is you know singing uh, offensive songs, they obviously can't arrest everyone. Um, but in terms of um, how fans experience it, um, I think that they would. I think that fans would certainly suggest that it's applied arbitrarily, um, and I think that they would feel that it's um, in some cases been applied overzealously by the police. Okay. And then if the other panel members have any um, Well, I mean, just a, a, a quick comment on that. I mean, first of all, you know, with reference to the 2015 evaluation, University of Stirling, Glasgow, and Scott Sense Social Research, I don't have that data in front of me at the moment, but the, one of the things that they did say was that they felt that there was some evidence of, you know, detracting from uh, attention to uh, relationships between, between uh, police and fans in some situations. And um, as Mr Quigley has just said, the, the experience is very different across Scottish football. I mean, mostly I spend my time in lower league football and so on, and really these issues don't seem to impact for, for the great majority of people for the great majority of, of time. But when I have been in matches between larger clubs and so on, the, the, the fan experience is very different, and you can certainly feel under a lot more pressure and scrutiny than you would uh, normally in other, in other parts of the game. Don't know if it's the act itself that's given it that opportunity, but undoubtedly, in, in the role I have, I go to a lot, a lot of football grounds around the country, there is uh, far less trust in the police. And I think the policing uh, of football matches has deteriorated over, over the last 10 years, possibly, you know, before the, the act. Um, I, I think, talk about individual instance, I was at a promotion match when party Thistle and Falkirk, and as the fans were doing the conga, the police were out with video cameras, video on every single one of the fans, and were approached, asked why they were doing it, and, why, and where that data was getting used, and where it was in stored, uh, they were threatened with, uh, with being arrested on the day that we won the championship. And I just think it's a perfect example of where, I don't know if it's this act, uh, you know, it's not my area of expertise, but I definitely think policing, and we've said that, you know, it should be by consent, and it, that's where the work needs to be put in, right across uh, the platform of all the different stakeholders, but it's, it's certainly not in a good place. Okay, Mr Jenkins, do you have any comment? Uh, on, on policing? The statistics I've got regarding policing at football matches in Scotland are that in the last uh, two seasons, supporters were more aware of police presence, uh, but actually there was a majority of fans that felt fans' behaviour hadn't improved as a result of that. So there seems to be a correlation between the two. Okay. And just finally, very briefly, Liam Kerr um, asked you about fan awareness um, of the Act and, and how you will cope with um, this if it's, if it's repealed. What will... The football <coughs> supporters associations do to communicate to their their members and the supporters in their clubs that this act has been repealed and make them aware that behaviour is not acceptable? Well, I mean, first of all, I think most fans' awareness is conditioned by the, the messages that they get from the clubs and from the fan groups that collaborate with the clubs. So, for example, in programmes, there'll be a notice about what is unacceptable behaviour, etc. And, I mean, certainly what we will do, whichever way this goes, is to ensure that the actual issues of sectarianism, homophobia, sexism, racism, and other forms of, of hate in football are addressed and uh, you know for example we we do think that serious attention needs to go towards the issue of strict liability um, i've already referred to the experiments that we're keen to be engaged in helping to come into fruition where we bring together fans stewards police and so on to look in particular situations about not only uh, disorder but bad behavior is dealt with as well as community initiatives that enable clubs to be more community friendly places more family friendly places etc so I think context is all. 
and one part of that context is obviously the um, hate crime review and we think it makes sense to consider these questions in the context of the hate crime review. The other thing is the responsibility that fans take themselves and the responsibility of those who actually govern football to engage with fans to address these behaviours at all levels. Okay, thank you. Lee MacArthur, uh, or is there anyone else wants to, to add anything? Uh, Mr. Jenkins? Add that uh, when, we, when we've put out our consultations in the past, we've always tried to leave a space for supporters to offer their opinion on if, how we best tackle these issues if it's not through legislation. Uh, I think the consensus is you can't punish a problem away. But actually, if you ask supporters what their views are, there seems to be three key things. Um, obviously, the SPFL have got their un own unacceptable conduct guidelines in place as of January this year. Uh, I think the Scottish Government will be getting feedback on, on how that's going. Um, but I think we would feel that clubs could be doing more to work with their supporters. Um, and the kind of three themes that we've picked out are about educational workshops for supporters around these issues, uh, improved and sensible policing, which is clear and consistent, uh, and more fan engagement and dialogue between all stakeholders, including police and stewards as well. Liam MacArthur? I, I think it's largely been picked up. I mean, in a sense, the, the message that was um, conveyed earlier around the, the repeal, particularly of Section 1, is that it would A, send the wrong message um, around tolerance towards hate crime in, in all its forms, and also inha inhibit the police and um, prosecuting services in, in dealing with instances. I think from what you've all of you have set out um, that there are a raft of, of, of different areas and where work can be done um, to ensure an, an appropriate target approach, building on the messages that have been coming through at a societal level. Would that be a fair characterisation of your, your views? Nodding of heads doesn't pick up uh, well yes, on the <laughs> official report. <laughs> Just thinking. I mean, clearly, yeah. Yes is the answer to that. I think, I think the key question as to, uh, you know, which, which this committee's come back to on a number of occasions is to how messages are sent out, is that actually part of the, the issue here is for politicians in terms of how it's handled. Um, because, uh, you know, I think one of the things that, that um, we felt very much in coming to give evidence to this committee is that we want to avoid being involved in a political stooshy over this because actually it ought to be something that politicians are able to come together on. Now the problem obviously is that there are strongly divergent views on the effectiveness and appropriateness of this particular act but there ought to be a way of addressing as I say the wider issues of, of hate crime and there ought to be very serious attention to possible gaps that may open up but in particular to further engagement with football fans and further, I would say, pressure on the football authorities to respond to these kind of issues because the solutions for problems that football faces and all sections of society have both general and some characteristic problems that they have to face has to come by football uh, owning and taking responsibility for the issues. And that's the primary context in which I think we can have a positive response. Right. I'm interested in that point. It's tangential slightly to the to the bill, but I think addressing one of the concerns that's been raised in relation to the bill, um, I, I think it would be helpful for the committee if there are specific ideas about how yes. that engagement could be made to work better, because I get the feeling that it works reasonably well in, in certain areas with certain clubs, uh, but perhaps across the piece isn't working as well as it might. And not in others, and that's certainly we want to pursue some of the issues that I've, I've uh, drawn attention to here, and also, of course, in our, our submission to the uh, hate crime review as well. I wonder, uh, Ms Finley, if I could ask you, um, you, you mentioned that there'd been a number and perhaps you could give a rough indication of how many um, cases of, of people being charged and then the, the case subsequently being dropped and the disproportionate um, effect that had had on the people who were charged. If you could give us some examples of previous cases and the type of behaviour that that covered and also to quantify how often, how prevalent this was. Okay. Um, it's less that they are charged and then the charge is dropped. In fact, charges are rarely dropped. It would be the normal practice of, as I understand it, fiscals and a sheriff court throughout Scotland to, to you know, sometimes strike out charges and, and make certain arrangements, and that never happens in football. F football cases are always prosecuted right up to trial in almost every case, so they're not dropped, but they have a, a, a lower chance of uh, success once they come to trial. Um, in terms of the numbers, 
we can speak to our analysis of the government's own data and, and, and the Crown Office data, which we've obviously followed and analysed regularly throughout the last six years. We can also speak to the people who come to us. We have, um, you know, a website with a, you know, a forum where people can say that they've been charged and ask for <coughs> support and help and assistance. And I can say that as the person who takes most of those phone calls in the initial, you know, in, in, the, in response to them in the initial um, uh, period. Overwhelmingly, I can think of almost maybe two in the whole of those six years where somebody had previous conviction. So most of the people that, I, that, that you know, contact us and say, this has happened, um, you know, what should I do? I need advice. Uh, they're rarely people with previous conviction. The Crown Office doesn't collect that data. Uh, you, the Crown Office official this morning referred to one case, but the Crown Office doesn't collect the data on whether people have previous convictions. We have, I suppose then, in that case, we have the only evidence of that. So out of the, over the last six years, I don't know, 200 people who have come across us, um, you know, I would say two had any type of previous conviction, and even those were, you know, sometimes 10, 15 uh, years old, and they were the very rare occasion of people who were sort of slightly older. Most people are, are, are a lot younger than that. Um, in terms of what happens to them uh, and the impact on them, um, in most cases, I don't know if you're aware of this, there's usually three appearances at court. There's when you go to the pleading diet, then there's an intermediate diet, and then there's a trial. Um, the evidence is, from our, our own experience and from the Stirling researches, that f in football cases, that's very often extended, very often uh, much longer than that, maybe four or five times, for various reasons. Um, because of the nature of where the offences, alleged offences, are supposed to have taken place, it quite often involves people travelling quite long distances, you know, so having to take time off work, having to tell their employers that they've been charged, there's all of that. Uh, the worst case that we had was seven young men who sang a song at an away game uh, and were appeared in court 17 times over 23 months, uh, and they were all acquitted uh, in the end of that. And one of them lost a promotion during that time. Two of them were completing their studies, which would have involved professional registration, and therefore were in jeopardy of losing not only just a job, but their entire career. Thank goodness that didn't happen. So that's a very extreme case, but it reflects cases that we see um, that happen quite often. Uh, so they take longer, they're never dropped. The fiscals, we've had numerous occasions of fiscals saying, you know, privately, look, I would, you know, this would go. They say to the defence solicitors that we work with, this would go, but I'm not allowed to drop it. They're simply not allowed to drop it. They're made to proceed to it to the fullest extent. And would that extent. be advice on, on, from a higher level? Yes, a, yes. A, they're never allowed to make that decision. Okay. Um, and think, obviously, um, your witness here is no longer here, but they're never allowed to make that decision. They have to phone and ask. And they would normally be for other types of offences, but they're not allowed to make that decision in football cases. And they're very rarely allowed uh, to drop football cases. And that seems to us to be tremendously, you know, punitive to, to, to prosecute cases to a much greater extent than you would in other circumstances. Uh -huh. And these are not cases, by and large, which involve any violence, involve any, you know, um, they're usually cases with no specified victim. I have been to many cases and I've yet to see somebody other than a police officer stand up in court and say that they were the victim of this offence. I think if you look, it's in our submission uh, uh, in the last uh, year, I think 86% of all cases, all charges under the Defensive Behaviour Act, uh, uh, there was no identifiable victim. It was either the police or the community as defined um, uh, by the police officer making the, uh, making so the I suppose charge. The point so there are making, no victims yeah, and, yeah. You know, and, and people are put through this kind of... Um, so I suppose the point that's, that's emerging from that is that there is, in your opinion, a lack of prosecutorial discretion at a certain level. It's a presumption that... I, I would actually the say there appears to be a lack of prosecutorial independence, yeah. which I find even more concerning than some of the issues around this act. Okay. 
Thank you for that. Um, if I might add to that, that, that yes, that if you could, Mr. Barrow. Sorry, the, the, there are prosecutorial issues there, but the, the general issue that we need to be looking at and that hasn't entered this, this debate enough, it seems to me, is the distinction in outcome and effect between primarily punitive approaches and restorative approaches to challenging difficult and defensive behaviour and, as I say, when the, the boundary is crossed into what should be criminalised behaviour because it's about, about violence and threat to, to people. And so on. This is an absolutely critical issue because otherwise we're in danger of pushing young people into a system where further criminalisation is going to be the outcome. Okay, thank you. And Ben, did you have a supplementary? I mean, I think it would be incumbent on us to write to the Crown Prosecutor Fiscal Service to ask for their uh, comments on what's just been said, because those are quite um, Happy to do serious that. statements. Yeah. Um, Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, you know, regardless of whatever um, people say, uh, stood on the Act, uh, initially when it was first in place. Um, I'm far from convinced that a repeal of the Act wouldn't send out entirely the wrong message. So I suppose what I want to ask the panel um, is where do each, and, and you've begun to touch on it through Lee MacArthur's question, but where do each of you stand on possible amendments to the Act rather than, a, rather than repeal? Where, where do you stand on that and do you see any merit in that going forward? Andrew? Fair to say that we as an organisation don't believe in football specific legislation. Um, therefore, your proposal earlier of widening out to the whole of society, I think, would be supported. Um, I don't think you can have legislation that, that can apply to one specific uh, sector of society. I think that's grossly unfair. Um, therefore, I think we would be, I think a step forward would be the proposal you, you uh, suggested earlier that it was widened out, not to sport, because I think that would criminalise sport fans, but to the whole of society. And just um, before anybody else in the panel answers, can I uh, add in as well to, to take into account Lord Brackadale's uh, you know, current review? Where do you think that should fit into this process? I think it's got to be a key part of it, and we've sat down with him and, and had th those discussions. But again, I, I would uh, echo that, that you know, this shouldn't be specific about sport. And that is the concern of our colleagues across Europe. They're looking at Scotland in isolation and saying, why has this happened? Uh, and it's very difficult, as somebody who's not so closely involved in it, to try and explain uh, why we've got to this place. And I mentioned earlier on about the PR. I think this is a, a PR mess that needs fixed. And I think it's got to be that, that you know, politicians from all the various parties get around the table to try and fix the mess. Because it's not sending good signals out about Scottish football, when at a time where it's actually we're trying to attract uh, young people and kids and families to the game. Uh, and all the evidence is that we're doing that really, really well at a lot, a lot of clubs. Um, but the, the act itself is, is just, it's, it's got a bad credibility, whether the ins and outs can't comment because I'm not a lawyer, but I think you've got to broaden it out or recut it in some shape or form. It's just not good news, really. Yeah. I mean, football, uh, football and sports-specific uh, legislation is unacceptable to fans. That's, that's clear. Um, whether reform and retitling is possible is a, a question that can be explored. Um, as Mr Goodwin has just said, the difficulty is that um, the, the PR so far has pushed people into a position of alienation, so there's a lot of ground to be made up as, as far as that is concerned. But clearly the uh, hate crime review is the context in which decisions like this should be, should be taken. Um, we would take the view that we support the outright repeal of the legislation now um, for the reason I just uh, kind of touched upon. We don't believe that it's right to have legislation which only applies to one sector of society. But we also um, don't think that criminalising offensiveness um, to the rest of society would work either. We would think that would present too great a, a danger to freedom of expression. Um, we would support the repeal of it as quickly as possible. Uh, Jeanette's touched on the kind of human cost um, of this legislation and what happens when people are dragged through the courts um, and how this drags on. People have lost their jobs, people have lost promotions, people have suffered varying degrees of mental health breakdowns, people um, have even suffered, you know, kind of fractured relationships. Um, and when, um, as is so often the case, you know, these people aren't found guilty, it doesn't undo any of the damage that's been done. These cases are going through. So, uh, sorry, you, if you so, just sorry, let me so finish, Mr McGregor. I, I was actually quite sympathetic to that argument in, mm -hmm. in the previous panel, but are they not more implementation issues as opposed to a repeal issue? 
No, no. What my point is is that um, in regards to the Bracken Deal report, um, we think that that obviously, you know, hate crimes a serious uh, issue in Scotland. It should absolutely um, be um, given the kind of time and energy that's required in order to try and deal with it. But um, we feel that this legislation is a slightly separate issue. And because these cases are still going through the courts, this isn't a, a static issue. This is live. These cases are still happening right now. Um, and people are still having their lives turned upside down. Uh, so we support a full repeal um, as quickly as possible. Very briefly. Legislation.gov.uk identifies for me there are 87 pieces of legislation in the UK pertaining specifically to football, starting in 1989. It's been said, particularly by, I think, Mr Jenkin, that no legislation should address football alone. Should all 87 pieces of primary and secondary UK and Scottish legislation therefore be abolished? Is why should it be football and, and not for the, the, the wider society? I think that's just the, the question I would ask as to why each of those acts were implemented. No, but, but, but very specifically you said if it refers to football, it should not be legislated for if it only refers to football. And I'm pointing out there are 80, starting in 1989, by the way, uh, there are 87 pieces of legislation which have football in the title. And I've had a quick look and they are specific to football. Are you saying all of these 87 pieces of legislation should be abolished? So my wider point was that in each of those I would be interested to know why it was just applied to football. Well, I can, 1989 is about offensive behaviour at football matches. You know, this is not new and there is not, this is not the first legislation on this particular, it's UK, not Scottish, I accept. But I'm just making the general point. But I, th I think I've probably heard all I'm going to hear, convener. Okay. Which only applies to football fans. Yes. Obviously, you'll have some yes. which will deal with things like, you know, drinking alcohol in a football stadium and, and that type of specific legislation. But would there be any which create, other than those types of, um, of behaviours, that creates a criminal offence which would only apply to football fans and no one else? Yes, the Football, football Spectators Act of 1989 would be an example that specifically creates offences related to football. Right, so we're so, not talking so about a new approach of, to legislation. So what type, so but can, can we I get an Well, now you've been made I'll aware of on. that, perhaps you can on. look, and if you want to submit something in response to that, now you've had a chance um, to, to, to okay. consider that point, the committee would be happy to, to receive that response. <laughs> I'm going to move straight on to James Kelly because I'm afraid time and the clock is, um, is, has beaten us. My apologies to George Adam. It was always dependent on um, the timing of the committee. If I could bring you in for a supplementary, James Kelly. Okay, uh, appreciate that, convener. I've, uh, I've got a, a question for each uh, member of the panel or each organisation that's represented. Uh, I mean, in terms of the submissions to the Justice Committee, we've heard... Uh, from the Law Society about uh, the, 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 that there wouldn't be any gap in the law. We've heard from civil rights groups about the, the imposition on civil liberties, but I think it's very important to hear from supporters groups because you're at the sharp end of being at the football, witnessing the effect of the legislation. So if I can start first of all by Andrew Jenkin, um, we've spoken about the, the international uh, context of this. What message do you think it sends out internationally that you know Scotland is seen to have a, a set of legislation that specifically targets football fans? I think there was one of our members, I think it was the Don supporters together, did a, a, a comparison of all the different football supporters across Europe and football supporters were the most um, legislated against in terms of their rights, in terms of safe standing, in terms of alcohol at football, uh, in terms of the Offensive Behaviour Act. So I think that needs to be addressed. And I certainly think it's unfair that those supporters in Scotland should be, should be criminalised because they are not going to football. OK. Um, in terms of the SFSA, you spoke interestingly about you know, building a more kind of collaborative approach you know, between fans groups, football clubs, uh, and also the police. Uh, do you think the, the absence, the, the repeal of this legislation, taking that off the table, would make that approach a bit easier to build? Yeah, I think it probably would. And I think it goes into that uh, debate of 
I've, I've mentioned PR three times now, but also when you talk the, the private um, discussions that you have with various different police uh, members versus the public uh, display of unity that they face, where most of the police actually say, look, there's, there's way around all these problems, which is, goes back to what your law society and the like uh, have submitted. So I think it's, um, from that point of view, something's got to happen, something's got to give, uh, to give people faith that, um, the con that you know, the concerns and the various different degrees that we have are, are being addressed, and that we can move on to, you know, to provide a, a place where everybody can work together. Okay, and finally, if, if I can ask Jeanette Finlay specifically about <coughs> conviction rates. We heard earlier from the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service that the conviction rates were, were I think the term used was very good um, for this, and it was, it was quite successful. And you've repeatedly said that that's not the case. Can you give us a bit more detail on your explanation for that? Conviction rates are presented in two ways in the two separate publications that are referred to. One is a Crown Office publication, the other one is a Scottish Government publication. One is called um, Offences Under the Offensive Behaviour Act, or Charges Under the Offensive Behaviour Act, and the other one is the Hate Crime. So either it's based on the year of the charge, so you have you know, however many charges there is in a year, but what's reported is a conviction rate based on however many um, cases are completed in a year. So let's say uh, you have, sorry, I had the date earlier, but um, let's say that you have um, 300 charges, but only 150 of them are actually concluded in one reporting period. Well, the conviction rate is based on the number of people convicted as a proportion of that much smaller number. And so it looks as though, you know, you have much higher conviction rates than you. The ones that are reported annually, you know, of around, you know, 70%, 75%, which actually in themselves are lower than most convictions. They're still low even at that. But they don't represent the true conviction rate. And in fact, the true conviction rate is never actually... Um, properly reported. Now, what we have done is counted all of the charges from 2011 till the most recent data, and we've counted all of the convictions. Now, this is from the Scottish Government data. This is not. This is their data, and the conviction rate is about 36 percent. It's just below 36. Now, there's a tail there of unconcluded cases. Now, even if every single one of those cases resulted in conviction, that wouldn't take the rate to 50%. So this 75% and, and so on that's often stated each year is vastly overinflated because most people would think a conviction rate would be the number of people charged in a year and then the number of people convicted shown as a proportion of that, but that's not what you're given. Okay, it might be useful, it's obviously up to the committee, but it might be useful to provide that analysis to the committee if that's not already been done. And uh, Mr Jenkins, if you wouldn't mind uh, supplying the full details of the refer you, uh, of the <coughs> survey you referred to that Sporters Direct Scotland had carried out, that would be very helpful. No that concludes our, our line of questioning and can I thank all the panel members very much for um, giving evidence today. Given that we're working um, really against the clock, I'm going to continue now to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number three, which is consideration of three negative instruments. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. The first instrument is Scottish Tribunals Eligibility for Appointment Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-274. Do members have any comments? If members have no comments, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? Agreed. agreed. Thank you, we are agreed. The next instrument is Sexual Offences Act 2003 Prescribed Police Station Scotland Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 oblique 285. Do members have any comments? No. Could, could I just perhaps um, seek some clarification? There are so many police stations uh, mentioned in this SSI, and I wondered if any of these were under threat of closure. 89 um, 
prescribed police stations as previously listed. Could we find out if any of these are currently under threat of closure? And I think that would be useful. If there are any other comments? No other comments. Um, are we uh, agreed that it doesn't want to make any recommendation to this <coughs> instrument? Agreed. agreed. Thank you for that. And the final instrument is Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003 Rural Housing Bodies, Amendment Number 2, Order 2, uh, 2017, SSI 2017, Oblique 301. Do members have any comments? No comments. Um, is the committee therefore agreed it doesn't? Yes. 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 Rural RSLs. It did not include ACCA, okay. Argyle Community Housing Association. It didn't include them, Britain. Okay. In my area, there are two. Okay. Can we note that and perhaps? Uh, that's okay. that's just give them a full name. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. I've misread that. No, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, thank John. you for that clarification, you, Mr. Mark. Finney. That's good. Oh. Is committee therefore agreed? It does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Agreed. Agreed, thank you. That concludes consideration of negative instruments. Agenda item number four is a feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 28th of September 2017. I refer members to paper four, which is noted by the clerk, and invite Mary Fee to provide feedback. Thank you, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 28th of September when it took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice on Governance of the Scottish Police Authority. The Cabinet Secretary told the subcommittee that, in his view, the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 was fit for purpose, but acknowledged that there have been issues with how the roles and responsibilities have been taken forward. He indicated that an interim chief executive should be in place within the next couple of weeks and that the appointment for a new chair was currently underway. And Mr Matheson described the current review of the SPA and the appointment of a new chair as an opportunity to improve some areas such as strengthening the input from local scrutiny committees to the SPA by providing them with a formal role. And the next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 26th of October when it will hold a roundtable evidence session on Police Scotland's engagement with black and minority ethnic communities. And I'm happy to take any questions. Members have any, uh, members have any comments or questions for, for Mary? No comments or questions. Then we now move into private session. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, 24th of October 2017, when our main business will be further consideration of the Offensive Behaviour Bill. I spend briefly to allow the public gallery to, to clear. <laughs>